What's that? Oh. It's amazing. Just Johnny. Are we not going to have um, Thomas Lynn? Good morning. This is Thomas. Good morning, Thomas. I, we're just, we're, we're still gathering. We're almost there. Sorry. No, I just want to make sure you realize I was. I thought I heard someone ask if I was there. I so. did, so thank you. I'm glad there's and there's Fred. Good morning, Fred. Good morning. Do are we waiting on anyone else? Uh, Johnny, obviously. I'm sorry. Oh, Savannah's virtual, also. Okay. Excellent. order the executive committee of the board of trustees and the first item of business is the approval of the minutes oh excuse me roll call trustee jones aye here trustee van hazer here and trustee harper here all present madam chair thank you and thank you all for being here and being here in person that's terrific um, now we will entertain the, the minutes of the June 23rd Executive Committee meeting. Hopefully you all have had a chance to review those. I'd entertain a motion. I move we accept the minutes. Second. Th thank you. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I think we can take a voice vote, can't we, Mr. Secretary? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right. Our next item on the agenda is a report from the Vice Chairman, Teresa Van Hooser, on the, uh, the, re the annual review of the President's performance. Yes, Chair Harper, the annual review was com uh, officially completed and sent to the Board and to the President on uh, September 26. Um, there were, of course, a couple of iterations throughout that for reviews, et cetera, but it was complete on September 26 on schedule thank you for that and thank you for your hard work on that and thanks to all of you who participated both uh well for all of you who participated either as faculty as uh as as cabinet members and as board members um i thought the input that we got this time was really material and helpful and i was very pleased and uh Vice Chairman Van Hooser did a terrific job pulling it all together, and I believe you have concurred with the report, right, Mr. President? Very good. All right, well, the next item of business, then, is the President's uh, annual compensation review, so uh, I'll turn it over to the Vice Chair, Teresa Van Hooser. Yes, Chair Harper, as you mentioned, the uh, the review that we had was outstanding. Uh, the president, the um, feedback that we got was all really good, but it also was very positive in achieving all of the, um, the goals and in his le leadership efforts uh, were significant during this performance period. And I moved, I'd like to move that, uh, do you want me to have a discussion first or would you want me to go ahead and make a motion? I prefer a motion okay. first, thank you. I'd like to move that the president receive a 6% performance evaluation raise. I don't, I don't know if I said that right, but a 6% salary raise. Thank you, and I think, is that retroactive to July 1st? Is that your proposal? Yes. Is there a second? I second the motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. And I'll just call for a voice vote since there's just three of us. All in favor of giving the president a 6% uh, raise on his salary effective July 1st, 2022, please say aye. Just a clarification. Oh. This is, we're voting to send it to the full board for Thank approval. you, I'm sorry, I should have been clear about that. Yes, this is our recommendation to the full board and the full board will have an opportunity. And I should have said if anybody has anything they want to say, they certainly can here or later. Hearing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Then that carries unanimously. Is there any other business to come before the, um, the executive committee of the Board of Trustees? Mr. Secretary, do you know of anything else we need to cover? No, Madam Chair. Well, thank you. I'll call us adjourned. And I think we'll move straight into, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one's next, academic and, and uh, student affairs. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Harper. Uh, it, we'll start uh, if uh, Secretary Ray will call the call the row, please. Trustee Alcott. Here. Trustee Wilmore. Here. Trustee Willis. Here. Oh, excuse, excuse me, Trustee, uh, Trustee Griffin. Here. Trustee Rose. Here. All present, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Secretary uh, Ray. Okay, uh, next we need an approval of our minutes. They were in your packet, but our minutes from the 20, June 23 committee meeting. Is there a, uh, any comments or I have reviewed there? the minutes and recommend they be approved. Okay, Trustee Wilmore recommends. Is there a second? Second. Probably the motion's been properly made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. likewise. Okay, you have approved the, the minutes. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, I think the next portion of our program is we're going to first have a report from the interim vice president, uh, Karen Likens, to, on our enrollment report. And she's going to share with us the fall 2022 numbers via video and then President Odom I think you're going to follow up with some comments after after Karen Lycan starts so do we have Karen ready hey Karen. welcome to the post game wrap up of the 21-22 fall recruitment season Golden Eagles are celebrating scoring the third largest freshman class in Tennessee Tech history and you may be expecting to see the winning play but this game is all about teamwork. But it didn't start here. It started here in the Jerry Whitson Welcome Center where every visitor is a VIP and it's spread across campus. So let's take a look at the key players and their stats for the final push this fall. First, we'll start with the final numbers for the fall freshman class. 2050 new freshmen with an average GPA of 3.66 and as a matter of fact, one third of the class had a 4.0 GPA. Their average ACT score is 24. And this is the most diverse class ever for a fall freshman class. With that in mind, it's time to look at the team and their numbers. The Trailblazers led their inaugural year of personal VIP visits. The group has about 50 founding members, which has grown to almost 65, and they hosted more than 3,500 students and family members. During August, the Office of Financial Aid answered almost 3,500 emails, averaging 20 per hour. 
More than 90% of our first-time freshmen are using federal and or state aid, and we increased federal work-study by 36%. The staff collectively worked just over 100 hours extra during August. The Launchpad Student Success Center, which is our first year and undecided advising center, advised more than 2,050 new students in more than 31,000 credit hours, over 47 majors and 97 concentrations. The Registrar's Office awarded transfer credit to more than 1,050 students. They registered 243 dual enrollment students from eight different high schools in 20 unique tech courses. And they increased classroom use efficiency and scheduled 3,603 courses for fall 2022. Communications and Marketing had almost 300 unique marketing projects with more than 23,000 individual tasks. The marketing campaign had 16 million impressions. The Tennessee Titans Learning Lab series reached more than 3,000 high school students and Tennessee Tech is number one in the state on TikTok. As a team, our admissions counselors, processors, and data team worked more than 7,700 applications. They admitted more than 5,700 students, and they made visits to high schools in almost every county in Tennessee. New student and family programs provided orientation for almost 2,600 new freshmen and transfer students plus their families. This included 10 two-day freshman SOAR sessions as well as transfer, international, and online programs. They also coordinated seven days of events in Week of Welcome. The Student Orientation Assistants, or SOAs, conducted more than 260 tradition group meetings. They welcomed more than 1,900 parent and family members. The International Office has increased overall international enrollment to about 300 students. Those students come from about 30 different countries. We could not have a successful year without the faculty and staff. They invested at least two days a week with VIP tours in colleges and departments. They dedicated countless hours to prepare for on-campus recruitment events, including preview day and spring showcase. And they made it personal, sending more than 6,000 handwritten cards to students. Remember, this team set a goal of 2,000 new freshmen, and they did not drop the ball before they crossed the goal line. Repeat victories are hard, but the bar has already been set for fall 2023 for 2,000 new freshmen. We've already kicked off the new recruitment season, but it seemed right to stop and say thank you for your support and your encouragement, and to celebrate the way we always do, with a big wings up. Well, that's hard to follow. <laughs> um, they, uh, as Karen did so well in this video, it, it took everybody on campus and they did a phenomenal job. And, uh, and I think we've proven that we can deliver on this kind of expectation for bringing in large freshman classes. And uh, we're glad to be able to do that. And we're sort of bucking the trend, uh, certainly nationally, but also regionally about uh, enrollment growth. So this is exciting. A couple things that didn't, she didn't hit on, uh, particularly in there that you'd be interested in, was the uh, first year retention rate uh, this year climbed back up. Uh, COVID uh, threw us a bit of a curve in a lot of ways, but but in terms of retention of students, uh, retention rates around the country uh, took a little bit of a, a hit during COVID. Uh, we're glad to see our retention, first year retention rate climb back up to uh, right at 79%, 78.5%. Uh, and so we're, uh, our goal continues to be 82% first year retention, but uh, we're, we're getting back in that, uh, in that range where it should be. Also, uh, six-year graduation rate, I think this is the second year in a row, uh, we hit over 60% six-year graduation rate. Uh, that's, uh, this, this one, 60.2, is an all-time high. 
So uh, we're excited about that. And so it's not just about getting freshmen here on campus and growing enrollment, but it's also helping students be successful and graduate on time, uh, make it as cost effective as possible by, by getting them out and into their career opportunities as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, really kudos to everybody in this uh, endeavor and a great job this year. And, and now it's uh, it's always hard to repeat championships, but but uh, that's our that's our goal now. We turn to the future, and and we're already uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but we're already tracking ahead of last year's pace in terms of freshman applications for uh, this next fall. So it, it's all looking pretty good. Dr. Oldham, what were the lessons learned? Did we do anything wrong that we can learn from that going forward? You know, I, I don't know that, well, there's always lessons to be learned, and, and I don't know that I would characterize anything as that we did anything wrong. I think there were some things that we saw that we could do even better, uh, and, uh, and, and we've identified some things that seem to work uh, that allow us to maybe double down in some areas and, and go even further. Uh, the, you know, the, the Trailblazer program with the student uh, personal tours has, has been a... Uh, raving success and so adding more trailblazers is something that we've already done and uh, enhancing that program uh, even greater and you know finding ways to support those student trailblazers is a big part of that uh, but uh, we also the the uh, changes in the scholarship program uh, that we implemented last year were also very successful we've we've looked at the the data around that and uh, although it was very successful, it looks like there's some optimization that we can still do, and we've already made some tweaks in that going forward uh, for this next year that we think will uh, make it even more successful. So, yeah, uh, we're, we're continuing to learn. Do you know um, how we lined up with the other LGIs in the state? Mm -hmm. uh, were we exceptional <laughs> compared to them? Or did the rest of them do about what we did? So there, it's a mixed bag. Uh, you know, about uh, about half of the other four-year campuses in the state saw some enrollment growth. Uh, we were a little unusual in the in the uh, increase in freshmen. Uh, not too many campuses saw a uh, significant increase in freshmen as we did, uh, and so that's probably where we stood out the, the most. Uh, of course, you know, when you look at total enrollment, <clears throat> there's a lot of factors that come into it. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, retention and, and transfer students and other uh, graduate student growth and all that. Uh, but the, the thing is, if, if, if some campuses saw larger freshman classes, you know, a year or two ago, they're going to continue to see some in overall enrollment growth because they, they had a uh, larger group earlier so uh, we haven't had that situation so actually the the large freshman class this year if we can couple that with with additional freshman classes of that size we will see su pretty substantial overall enrollment growth over the next two or three years and that's that's our plan but but yeah we I, I don't know if I'd characterize it as we stand out uh, but we we're certainly in the uh, the upper class of our competitors uh, around the state. It would seem to me with that high GPA that the freshmen bring to the table um, that we ought to be more successful in our retention rate mm -hmm. from first to the second year. Is that reasonable to assume? Well, it, there is a correlation. It's, uh, it's maybe not as strong as a lot of people think, but there is a correlation between uh, uh, high school academic success and retention in college. Uh, we uh, we believe that based on our student profile uh, for the kind of freshmen that we get, we think an 82% retention rate is reasonable, and and uh, it's a little ambitious, but it's reasonable, uh, and I think we can get there. But uh, so we've still got some work to do, but but uh, but yeah, we're uh, you know two or three percentage points below that right now, so it's not too bad. Thank you. Yep. Dr. Oldham, can you tell us, do you know which college had the highest percentage increase of enrollment? Uh, highest he asked innocently. Do, <laughs> he asked innocently. Yeah. Uh, the highest percentage of overall enrollment increase? Enrollment increase. 
I think it was fine arts, wasn't it? Oh, college on campus. I thought, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'm slow this morning. Yes, uh, yes. I think fine arts had the. Uh, I believe that's true. That they, uh, the College of Fine Arts had the uh, highest uh, percentage enrollment increase, which is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And it's no yes. doubt because of uh, the absolutely wonderful faculty and staff yeah. in the college. Art was flat, by the way. Music was. Yep. Any other comments or questions? I, I have just one comment, and I should have probably done it before Dr. Oldham started his remarks. But I don't know about you, but I thought that that video was just amazing, and and I thought the energy of it was great, and the content was terrific and Karen of course is a genius at those things and I had a chance to see it ahead of time and I asked her to give me the names and I, I think some of you may even be here so I want to be sure that I thank those of you from the staff who put together that video um, and if you're here if you'll stand up so we can recognize you Courtney Bram, Angie Clark, Brittany Copley, Brandy Fletcher, Cassandra Grundyke, Mary McCaskey, and a different Mary McCaskey. Do we have two Mary McCaskies? Okay, excellent. Sorry, I didn't want to say, say that wrong. Alan Mullis, Judy Rigsby, Frank Tittle, and then are there others that participated that I didn't name? Please stand up. Well, that was just an amazing product, you guys, and I just want you to know that we are very, you, you do a lot for our reputation when you produce that kind of a, of a product, and I know you're doing that day in and day out, but that was really amazing, and we enjoyed it, but it was also informative, and I suspect it'll be a piece that you'll be able to use throughout the year. So thank you all. Join me in thanking them, please. And thank you all for coming out early this morning so we could do that. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I can't I was, believe there, yes. Oh, I was just curious. I, I'm, I think Karen Likens is doing obviously a great job and she's doing double duty. Um, is there a timeline for um, her not doing double duty and that or, or the, And, and uh, we've been running uh, 13, 1400 graduate students a year. So you'll get some new graduate students every year. Um, and uh, then you've got some, uh, there's, there's smaller numbers of dual enrollment high school students. I think the number here is about 200, maybe 300 dual enrollment uh, students uh, this current year. Uh, so all those sort of come together to, to make the overall enrollment picture. Uh, our, our modeling uh, tells us that if we, if we bring in, if we consistently bring in 2,000 freshmen, uh, then it, it would get us, uh, and, and we make some other uh, tweaks at, uh, with graduate students and the, hit our retention rate goals, uh, and also uh, look at international student growth. Uh, we'll, we'll be approaching that 12,000 total enrollment mark that we have in mind. So the, the 2,000 freshmen is the biggest piece uh, to help us get there, and so uh, being able to to uh, put all these pieces together for this year, I think is a is a huge step forward for us. I think we've I think we've shown that, uh, and there's a, there's a, a Karen kind of hit on a lot of this, but there's obviously a lot of moving parts in making this happen, uh, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit in my report this afternoon. But uh, I think we've we found for the most part, uh, the, the working formula that can be successful. Uh, I don't think it's optimized quite yet, but we're, we're pretty close. And so now it's a question of can we, can we repeat this uh, consistently? And that's, that's the goal. Does that help? I had a question about, um, I know that we kind of benefited in the graduate area, as many schools did during COVID and the shutdown. A lot of people just decided to go back to school or continue school because of the challenge. Um, so anyway, percentage-wise, it would be hard to keep that up. Um, but I'm wondering, as far as international students, um, is, do we see momentum and are we really, strat or how are we strategizing to get our international students' uh, recruitment back up? <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of our focus obviously has been because the freshman is the biggest piece of this in just terms of magnitude 
Uh, and so a lot of our focus has been placed there. Now that we feel like we've got that somewhat on track, uh, our attention is, is now getting redirected towards some of those other populations of students, uh, graduate students and international students. And uh, Provost Bruce is working on a, on a strategic plan for graduate student growth. Uh, we're also looking at international student growth. Uh, it's, a, it's a little trickier because you've got, you've got a lot of other variables, uh, obviously around the world, every, every part of the world is a little different in terms of, of how we market uh, opportunities to them and how we, uh, how we can uh, approach them uh, significantly and, and attract more international students. But it is, it is something we're keen on and we're working on it. Uh, one of the biggest areas, quite honestly, and that's something the board may, may be asked to weigh in on uh, in the future, and that's the, the price point for international students. I think we're, <clears throat> we're, we're still a little uh, high on the price point uh, to get us where we need to go, and uh, we're, we're looking at all that right now to see what we can do to, to maybe get that down, and whether it's scholarships or reducing the... Uh, the uh, uh, international fees associated. I'm not sure what the right approach is yet, but but we're looking at that price point. For some reason, getting it below the 20,000 mark is is sort of key, and we're uh, we're just a little high right now competitively. As our grad, I, I, the reason I brought these two in, uh, up together is it my it's my impression that we have a um, higher percentage of international students in graduate studies, or is it in? Are they freshmen and as or um, undergraduates as well? Yeah, I don't. I don't have the breakdown in front of me, but uh, you, most most institutions you would see the the bulk of international students at the graduate level. I think here at Tennessee Tech, it's been a, a, a little unusually uh, e more evenly distrib distributed between undergraduate and graduate. Uh, I think probably right now it's mostly graduate, but we still have a fairly healthy undergraduate population of international students. Very good. Any other comments or questions? It was a great video and uh, some good discussion here. And, and President Odom, uh, congratulations on the third highest freshman class in the history. I think with all the challenges we have right now and in higher education, that that is uh, that's certainly something to be proud of, as well as the increase in the retention. So when I, you I couple think we, the I two, think we, I think we missed the second highest class by 18 students. So it was, wow, we were very close. So, yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations to you. So it's time for the provost report. So next we have Provost Bruce, and she's going to provide us some updates on academic affairs. Uh, including some of the student success initiatives, and some of the developments in our academic programs, and then highlights of some of our faculty and staff achievements. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will just segue right from that, that enrollment report into academic affairs, and a lot of what I'm going to present to you today are, is, is in the realm of enrollment and recruitment and, and even more on retention. We have a large freshman class. It's incumbent upon us to make sure that they're successful and they graduate. Um, some of the recruitment, uh, Johnny asked the question about lessons learned. From an academic affairs perspective, we looked back at things we did last year on recruitment and on retention and on student success and did kind of a deep dive on that to, de to determine what helped the most and then kind of double down in those areas. And so one of the things that our faculty and staff in academic affairs do is they get out in front of high school students. Um, I asked the deans on Monday, I said, just quickly, don't, don't go do a big survey, quickly give me a bulleted list of what you know your college did in the last two weeks in addition to our big preview day event in terms of those kinds of activities. And they reported back 52 high school visits, 
and that ranged from you know individual faculty going out and visiting a classroom to kind of a concerted effort of, of manning a, a, a marching band competition, right? So 52 of those types of visits just in about a week and a half period. And so that gives you some idea of the scale and the scope of how much we're going out and getting in front of groups. Uh, visits to community colleges, uh, and hosting high school students here. So it's a blend of getting out there in front of them and hosting them back here. And so we had, in that week and a half or two weeks, we had 22 groups of high school students come here and visit. And sometimes that's a small group. So like in the College of Business, they may be hosting a group from the uh, Future Business Leaders of America. They host a club. In education, they might host a group of students who self-identified as future teachers and, but sometimes it's large scale events. Our, co our School of Agriculture, just in the last couple of weeks, hosted FFA clinics. That means soil judging, cattle judging. They hosted 600 students from across the state. And they had a 4-H day, and they hosted 400 students from across the state in 4-H day. Uh, if any of you are still around tomorrow, we have Manufacturing Day um, in the College of Engineering. So we hold these events to host people here. The main thing we need to recognize in academic affairs is every time we do an outreach event, a research activity, that's an opportunity for us to, to affect the high school and the community college and potential grad students, their impression of us, to make them want to come here to, to study. Now, on the side of retention, um, we looked back at what we did last year, and let's see, uh, as Dr. Oldham uh, stated, two, two years ago, um, or one year ago, we would have been reporting to you a first year retention rate of 72.9%. This year, we raised that 5.6 percentage points to 78.5, and our goal is to get to the president's goal of 82 or higher. Uh, to put that into perspective, um, the other LGI's first year retention rates, according to what's on their, on their websites, range from 53 to 74%. So uh, to be in the upper 70s means we're at the top in the LGI's, but we're not going to rest on that, and we're going to push to get that over 82%. So the types of things that we did this past year, um, and we're, we're obviously expanding and, and repeating and expanding this year, is number one, an emphasis on in-person experiences, particularly for our freshmen and sophomores. Uh, as you know, during COVID, I would present to you lots of data about the blend of in-person and, and uh, online, and we had lots of uh, quantitative and qualitative data to show that our underclassmen academically succeed at a higher rate when they have an in-person experience. So this year we have 90, overall our undergrad classes are 92% in person and 8% online. At the freshman level, it's 96% in person and 4% online. And typically when we have an online course, it's when we have multiple sections. So for example, we might have 20 sections of English freshman composition, you know, 18 of them are in person, two are online. So we want to give the students who need an online option, we want to give them that option, but keep the majority focused in an in-person experience. So we also, last year, had a special emphasis on attendance reporting. There is a lot of research that shows that when we take attendance in a class, that a student knows someone's watching they are there to know whether they're there or not. They're more likely to show up and attend class and they're more likely to succeed academically. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand if you go to class, you're more likely to, to, you're more likely to do well. So we have a big emphasis on attendance reporting. We have put in place new tools, particularly for large classes, large sections. So if we have a large section of, you know, intro to biology, there could be 80 to 100 students in there. The larger the section, the less, the more likely the student is going to feel they can skip and no one will notice. So it's really important that we have good tools. And we have new things like QR codes. A faculty member can flash a QR code on the screen. Every student just puts their phone up. 
boom, they take attendance in about a minute's time. Uh, we have, we installed card readers in some of our large auditorium classrooms so students just swipe their ID, they get their attendance report. But taking attendance is only half of it. Following up on that is the other half. And so obviously faculty are gonna follow up when they see someone not showing up to class. But when we use these tools for attendance reporting, it goes into a system uh, here, tech, we call it Tech Connect. And faculty advisors and professional advisors can monitor their list of advisees. And when they start seeing patterns of absences, they reach out to those students. And as one advisee, uh, one faculty member told me, they said, I'll talk to a student and say, how are things going? Good, good, it's good. And they said, well, what about those last four times you skipped class? Uh, you, you didn't, you weren't in that, you know, in English composition. Oh, you want to talk about that, you know? So it, it, it gives the advisors data to be able to do what we would call intrusive advising. We don't wait for the student to come to us and seek help. We go to them and intrude into their space and provide help. And on that note, the College of Engineering uh, has done an excellent job of looking at their students who get into uh, what we call academic, uh, they called it uh, at-risk intervention. So when they see students getting into an academic at-risk situation, they're in an academic warning, they're on an academic probation, they intervene and take action quickly. They don't wait for the student to come and ask for help. Part of that was driven by the fact that they looked deeply at their student population. And what we often assume happens is a student's in engineering, they academically start struggling, they switch to another major. We found that we had a significant number of students just leaving. They weren't switching to another major. And when they looked more deeply at why, it was because the student was getting in such academic struggles, they just could, they dug a hole they couldn't dig out of even if they switched to another major. So the goal is to identify them, intervene quickly, help them be successful in engineering if they want to stay in engineering, help them get to a place on campus where they can be successful if they're not going to stay in engineering. They were able to reduce their academic at-risk population from 17.2% to 13.2%. So that's a very uh, intentional strategic act within a college. In the College of Arts and Sciences, they really focused on areas where freshmen and sophomores are typically going to struggle. Uh, calculus 1, physics, chemistry 1010, English composition, and so took a real look at which courses the students struggle with the most, and then some of those courses, they've restructured them. Many of them, they've added what we call supplemental instruction. So for example, you might be in Calculus 1, Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. On Tuesday, Thursday afternoon, you have an opportunity to go, it, it's voluntary, but you have an opportunity to go and receive supplemental instruction oftentimes by maybe a senior math student or a senior engineering student who's then doing problem sessions, working examples, and helping the students in those special supplemental instructions. We also restructured how we do tutoring. We still have some generalized tutoring services in the library, but now we've restructured it and put a lot of our resources on tutoring that's very strategically placed on the courses where we know students are gonna struggle. That again is not waiting for the students to come to us and tell us they need tutoring, but putting the tutors in front of them so that they have to opt out, they don't have to opt in. So that is uh, some of the examples of some of the things that we did last year that we've, we're expanding this year because again our goal is to get that retention rate above 82%. So next I want to highlight a couple of, of grants, external uh, grants and highlight the grantsmanship of our faculty and staff and I have two examples. I have one where the grant, the, the size monetarily is kind of small but it has a big impact and then a, my next one I'll highlight is a much larger grant that's a federal grant. So this first one is a, is a program called RAMP, Reinforcing Advanced Math Placement. 
and the individuals who wrote this proposal and ran this program include Dr. Yelamarthy Kumar, or Dr. Kumar Yelamarthy, uh, Elizabeth Powell, Harry Engel, Kristen McWilliams, and then out of, those are all out of engineering and out of math, Dr. Michael Allen, Sam Naremetla, Troy Brackey, and Mark Rogers. And before I even get into the details, I want to make sure you know the, these people work hard. They write proposals. They run summer programs to make sure our students are successful. So if they're here, with, if any of those individuals are here, will you stand up? And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll lean on them to answer the questions. But so what is RAMP? RAMP is a program that is uh, targeted on incoming freshmen who met all the criteria to be, to be admitted to Tennessee Tech. They met all the criteria to be admitted into engineering. That was their desire, except their math placement score. And their math placement score was too low for them to proceed into the math courses they need to enter into in engineering. So this grant is a $50,000 grant from TBR and it was used to run a week, a one week residential program. So the students got to move into their dorms, their residence halls a week early. They came a week before the fall semester started. They got to move in early. And I, what I refer to it as is kind of like an intensive math camp. And so they had a week where they worked, where math, math faculty taught them, instructed them, tutored them, and helped them bring up their math scores. And the 83 first-time freshmen that participated in this, over half at the end of that week were able to score high enough to be fully admitted into engineering. When you say math placement score, you mean like the ACT mm -hmm. portion, math portion? And AccuPlacer, we have different scores, yes. Those standardized test scores that we use that allow us to place a student into a very particular math course, yes. So over half were able to raise their test scores where they're fully admitted into engineering. Over about two thirds of them we're able to, we can show, we'll graduate one semester ahead of what they would have if they had not gone to that one week residential camp. So if you think about math, if you're, if you know, you've got these long prereq sequences to get into the math and engineering, if, if you're starting too far back, it's adding semesters to your time in college. So this is a really important outcome for those students. Two thirds of them we can show were able to shave off a semester of their time in college. Um, so that's one example with an, uh, of a uh, faculty led. And Dr. Bruce, can I ask a question? Oh, yes. <laughs> yep. the, uh, the, the students who were able to get into engineering, how did, how did they perform in the engineering program? Well, th we don't, with their, these are freshmen this fall. This is a, okay, yeah. So they're in yeah. their first semester right now. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Well, well it'll be very, uh, uh, you know, from a scholarship perspective, it'll be very interesting to look back and see uh, how much did that, what difference did that make on that population of students in terms of their uh, their performance this first semester. But I don't want to. I don't want to. I mean, the the academic part of that residential program is obviously the focus. But I don't want to diminish the the aspect either that they get to show up a week early. They get to connect with their fellow students. They get one-on-one -on -one connections with the faculty that are likely going to be teaching them in that freshman year. And so it really, it is, it is their on-ramp to their freshman year and being successful during that year. I just want to say thank you to those faculty that are doing that. That is, I, I, I put myself in those shoes. Math wasn't my weakness, but I had others. <laughs> but um, this is, this is a phenomenal opportunity for the very, heartbeat of our student body, I would think. So I'm just so grateful to the faculty who have to lean into this ahead of time and that can't be easy. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and my next um, externally funded grant that I would like to highlight is one uh, that's a federal grant. It's a $3 million grant from the National Science Foundation. And the name of the grant is engendering the spirit of Gaduji at the Food Energy Water Nexus. And you might be asking, what is Gaduji? 
Okay, so Gaduji is a Cherokee term that means working together for the common good. Okay, and so the idea of this grant is that it funds at least 20 master's and doctoral students on full fellowships, you know, we would say full scholarships if it was an undergrad, full fellowships at the graduate level, and a, and a number of other students partially to participate in activities. But these students that are fully funded on these fellowships um, are ones that are conducting research on challenges at the food energy water nexus. So for example, they might be doing research on uh, solar farms and how, does that, how is that impacting the water quality in an area. So where food, energy, and water are interacting, those challenges, those are the areas where these students are conducting research. And there's an emphasis on having them apply their research and can gather their data and conduct their research in areas of Appalachian rural areas, so it fits in nicely with our, our grand challenge of rural reimagined, but a special emphasis on Appalachian communities and Cherokee communities. And the, um, it's a very uh, interdisciplinary type, as you can imagine, interdisciplinary type approach when you're looking at uh, food, energy, water interconnections. And so uh, the faculty that are leading this program come from engineering, education, political science, public policy, sociology, history, um, a very, very diverse uh, group of faculty. And so I want to recognize the faculty that are leading this program. And they, this is a type of program they have weekly meetings. They are weekly meeting to run the program as well as mentor the students. Because when we send students who might not come from rural Appalachia or might not come from a Cherokee community, when we send students into those communities to conduct research, they need a lot of mentoring and coaching from people who are experts in those cultural dynamics. So. I want to recognize, and if, you, if you're here and I read your name, please, please stand. Uh, the faculty leaders that are running this program are Dr. Pedro Arce, uh, Dr. Andrea Arce Trigotti, uh, Dr. Rufaro Chatillo, Dr. Lauren Harding, Dr. Ada Haynes, Dr. Satish Mahajan, Dr. Robbie Sanders, and Dr. Troy Smith. And one other just comment on this, um, these, these fellowships, National Science Foundation sets the level of the fellowships. It's $34,000 a year plus all tuition and fees. We have to demonstrate to National Science Foundation that there's no out-of-pocket cost to the students. So what does that do? That allows our faculty to recruit nationally at a highly competitive uh, pool of students. This allows us to recruit and retain the very best master's and doctoral students in those fields. And it's a testament to National Science Foundation's belief in our faculty scholarship and research that they're willing to pay that level of funds for our faculty's graduate mentor mentees. So this is an exciting project, to say the least. And then my last item in the provost report is just an informational item. Uh, you may recall that maybe I think one or two board meetings ago, I brought to this committee uh, a request to approve a letter of notification, that's that phase one pro in the process of a new academic program. And uh, you, you voted to approve uh, me moving forward with a letter of notification for a master's degree in environmental agri-science technology. Well, I mean, what a, what a perfect segue from that last project. Uh, once we have a master's program in environmental agri-science technology, uh, that's a perfect uh, program to work in the energy food water nexus. But I just wanted to give you an informational item that THEC did approve that, and we have moved forward with the full new academic program proposal. And so you should be on the lookout for that in the next one or two board meetings. I'll be coming forward with the full proposal.
Any questions? I have a question. When we, when we first started this board, it's about the first or second meeting, we approved a uh, new nursing master's in a nursing degree. That's the last time I've ever heard about that. Oh, okay. So I'd like to have some follow-up on a periodic basis so that this board understands how successful we were in bringing that to the table or how unsuccessful we've been in recruiting for the program and what kind of cost it is to the university. Okay, thank Please. you. I will do that. I will put together a report on that. I can just say anecdotally, the Master of Science in Nursing, that's the MSN program I believe you're referring to, has been wildly successful. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'd have enrollment projections. And so I can tell you that THEC monitors us. We have to do something called a post-approval monitoring report. And any new program that we bring on, on into our, uh, uh, collection of academic programs for five years we have to report on how we performed relative to what we said in that nap that we thought how we thought we would perform so I'll pull that together and hopefully a succinct report for you it may not be anything more than just showing us what you're reporting yeah. to THEC thank you I was going to um, comment on the ramp program, which I think is awesome, and that's one of those little things, like you said, that's, um, I had a conversation with somebody about research and grants, little ones that are really million dollar grants, that's going to influence us in so many positive ways when you think about retention, um, graduation rates, the six year, trying to get people out of here in six years, or sometimes four, um, things like that. And I also think maybe in, a rec in an area of recruiting, I think that's a, a great way to um, maybe make an effort to reach out because um, there are a lot of people, I, I'm always shocked at people at the age of 16, they try and make kids decide like what they're gonna be. <laughs> Not all of us knew what we were gonna be, some of us did, but um, so that kind of late entry, there are a lot of people who kind of have an acceleration of academic uh, achievement in high school um, some fall the other way, but there are some who really start ramping up just as a matter of maturity. So I hope that um, admissions can, and you can work on that uh, in the same way. And I also am so glad that you mentioned intrusive advising. I'm just gonna make a sign and put that in my office. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? I like the RAMP program too because I suspect, and it'd be interesting maybe during the break some could share with me that there very likely could be some students that came from high school backgrounds that just didn't have that oppor the same academic opportunities yes. uh, and so it easily moves them up where they need to be, hopefully. Oftentimes we see that it's students from uh, maybe smaller rural high schools or first-gen students whose parents didn't, uh, they, they just didn't have the, the family or the school interactions that maybe encouraged them to retake tests, to score higher, you know. And so the type of student demographic that we see in that, it's a more diverse student body than the norm of the higher ACT. And I mean diverse in terms of geography, you know, gender, race, in every way. It's a very diverse group of individuals, but oftentimes they're coming from high schools that didn't have as much of a academic support or that, that students are coming from other high schools had. I'll just say for Johnny, I have a niece that completed her Master's of Science in Nursing last year, so it's a great program. I'll, I'll just add real quick, and, and uh, Provost Bruce, you may want to add to this. The uh, Winston Hester School of uh, uh, Nursing just celebrated for their 40th anniversary uh, on campus, and it's uh, um, we, we, Lori, we may want to have something maybe at the December meeting just to highlight that. That's a, it's a remarkable achievement for our School of Nursing, and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful event, and uh, a, lot of the, a number of those individuals who helped start the School of Nursing here are still around to enjoy uh, what it's become, which is uh, pretty remarkable. But uh, anyway, I just want to let everybody know that the School of Nursing is 
extremely uh, uh, productive and uh, it's going well. And they were able to, to show that we have, we have graduated and placed predominantly in Tennessee, very few of them leave the state, uh, 2,700 nurses over that time period. And so the difference that that's making in the healthcare system, particularly in the Upper Cumberland, but in the whole state is, is immeasurable. Very good, any other comments or questions? So Provost Bruce, I think you started by giving us an update on the academic program and on the BS in music, and that is an action item. So we've heard uh, Provost Bruce's uh, proposal about the academic program for BS in music. Is, is there a motion to oh, move oh, that I, to the full board? I just mentioned the, the master's in agri environmental agri-science technology. I still need to... I need to cover the the. Oh, I got ahead yes of music. All right, sorry. No, no, you're fine. Do you want me to move forward with that? Yes, please. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No. Um, so the BS uh, in music is the degree that we're coming to the board and seeking approval for today. This proposal was led by the faculty in the School of Music, um, in the College of Fine Arts. The School of Music currently offers. Uh, bachelor's degrees in music education and music performance. And while these degree programs continue to be successful, we see a growing need for a new program that provides students with greater curricular flexibility, broader content, and training for careers that do not fit in the traditional models of music education and music performance. So we seek to add the BS degree to expand degree offerings that capitalize on the strong science, technology, engineering, and math uh, programming that's already in place at Tennessee Tech. The new degree program is designed to serve our student population as we increase the number of transfer students, as we increase the number of students who come in with a significant amount of dual enrollment credit coming out of high school, and just to serve students who want to have a career in the music field, but not necessarily have a career as a music performer. And so this uh, serves those, those student populations. The School of Music is a, uh, their programs are accredited by the National Association of the Schools of Music, and the proposed BS degree program will meet both the university and the NASM standards to ensure that continued accreditation. Our enrollment and financial projections are very modest. Uh, we're being very conservative in our enrollment projections. Uh, we, we are hoping to start out in year one with eight students and then work toward about 30 students majoring in, in this within the first few years. And the School of Music will utilize resources presently available to launch and support the new program. Uh, at this time, they will not require new faculty, uh, or significant amounts of new space or infrastructure for the degree program. It will predominantly use what's in place combined with uh, science, technology, engineering, and math components from across campus and business components from across campus. Um, so the added instructional cost for this program is only about $5,000 a year, but at, 30, at a steady state of 30 students uh, in the program, that would, that would uh, translate to about 300,000 in revenue. So it, it, will be a, it could be a boost to the School of, of uh, Music from that perspective. Um, but predominantly, we're putting it in place because it will meet the needs of a population of students that we're currently not meeting. Dr. Bruce, can I add something about the, um, we all look for enrollment numbers to be going up. And um, that's great, but this is also gonna be a great thing for retention in the School of Music. A lot of times we'll have, um, we have what's called a barrier at the junior level for a performance degree. Those are the people who don't wanna become a public, uh, an accredited music educator, uh, educator, which would be a BME. And so those people want to continue their music studies, but they aren't at the performance level where they're going to be accepted to graduate school. And they don't necessarily want to be a performer, but they wanna stay in music, they're gonna find their way this allows us to keep them. A lot of times they dis disappear into the College of Interdisciplinary Studies um, because they want to finish their degree, um, but this 
allows us to keep them and then to further specialize what it is that they want to do for the various programs. There are a lot of ways that we can articulate the um, BS in music. So, and it also will keep our ensemble numbers high and we love to have critical <laughs> mass because it takes stress off of the students when we have critical mass. Not everybody has to perform in everything um, and we found that even this year with our, again, that increased enrollment I talked to you about. So um, it's a real win-win in addition to the numbers that we most easily are attracted to. It, the word has gotten out amongst the students about, and potential students, about the possibility of this program, and they're very excited. I also want to recognize, you know, the faculty put this proposal together. They do the, the lion's share of the work on this, and I want to recognize the director of the School of Music. I hope he's here, Dr. Colin Hill. He is doing a fantastic job. I have a question, please. Um, how are you going to do uh, this program that brings in $300,000 worth of additional tuition for only $5,000 in academic cost? Is somebody going to teach an extra class? I couldn't hear the last part of the question. The, how are you going to uh, bring in this revenue with only $5,000 of, ac of uh, academic cost? Because when we have a, when we have like the School of Music, um, I don't know how many faculty are in the School of Music, I would guess. We have about 23 full-time mm -hmm. and another six or seven adjuncts. Right. And so the, if you think about this type of program, we have about 23 faculty in the School of Music and they're teaching music theory and, you know, music courses, but those courses um, might have capacity for a few extra students in that section. And so this type of degree program is, allows a student to build a program of study where maybe they don't have as many courses in music because they're not going into music performance. They have a module of courses in this, from music, but they also take business courses, uh, maybe computer science courses. So they're, t they're taking a breadth of courses that we already offer. And so the additional instructional costs is minimal because we're already offering those courses and there's capacity to absorb more students into those courses. So this gives a student an option to, as their program of study, they take the courses that we're already offering. We wouldn't start suddenly start teaching lots of new and additional courses for this degree program. That's why the additional instructional costs are low. Now we might have to add extra equipment in a lab. We have to supplement the infrastructure to support those students academically. We also have to support those students through counseling services, through all of the non-academic components of the university. So the revenue goes to support the program and all of those services that a student would 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 cert, would receive, but the instructional cost, the additional instructional cost, is very minimal. Any other comments or questions? Very good. Now I will entertain a, a motion uh, to send this to the full committee. Okay, Trustee Alcott makes the motion. Second. Trustee Wilmore seconds. Any opposition? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed likewise. We didn't need roll call, right? Okay. All right. Motion passes. Uh, President Odom, it looks like you're back up again uh, to give us a report from the Office of Research and Economic Development and in, including the year end of year report for 2022. Yes, thank you. And, uh, it's my pleasure to give the report for uh, research and economic development. Uh, we're doing, we're, uh, and before I get to that, though, let me real quick, since we've been on music for a little bit here, let me just throw in, because we don't talk about this very much in board meeting, that's our Golden Eagle marching band, if you don't mind, Colin, I'll bring this up. So uh, I think with some of the, that enrollment growth, we've seen also a, a pretty significant uh, increase in the number of students participating in the marching band. And I think we're 170-something 
uh, this year, which uh, if you have a chance to attend one of our home football games soon, you'll get a chance to, to see the performance of the marching band, and they're doing an well, outstanding job, and, and uh, it, you'll, you'll get to see some of the energy <clears throat> that's being, uh, being committed into that program. So uh, that's, that's one of those areas that uh, it is academic, but it's not quite academic. Uh, it's sort of in, in, in between. Uh, but it's a great example of uh, the energy that's uh, coming out of School of Music right now. So uh, research and economic development. We're going through some transition right now. Dr. Taylor has announced she, she's uh, stepped down as vice president for research and economic development. And in the transition, we'll be, uh, we'll be go, uh, uh, launching a search for the next vice president uh, uh, coming up here in the next uh, just few weeks uh, and get that going. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll be bringing on a uh, full-time consultant for a few months, uh, Dr. Carl Pinkert, former uh, research VP at University of Alabama, will join us on a, on a uh, temporary basis for the next few months uh, to help us with that transition. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm pleased to, to give a report on where we've been and where we're headed with the research funding. And those of you that were with us last night for the Wings Up 100 awards, you got a, you got a chance to experience a little bit of the personality uh, behind some of this work. Uh, we, we were able to recognize 36 individuals uh, last night that were awarded uh, at least $100,000 uh, in uh, sponsored research awards last year. Uh, that, that number of awardees seems to grow each year, which is a good thing. And as you see from the, from the trend over the last 10 years, our funded research continues to grow uh, substantially as well. So we are uh, continuing to make progress toward that goal of getting to 40 million in uh, funded research. Uh, and uh, we hope to make that continue, obviously. Um, so this was a record high this year with uh, 23.6 million, and you see a breakdown by college of, uh, and you see a pretty substantial uh, distribution across campus. Uh, engineering, College of Engineering leads the way at uh, seven and a half million, but, but you see uh, you know, significant contributions from uh, many of the other colleges on campus. And so th this, is, this is not, uh, focused uh, completely in engineering or the sciences, but really distributed across campus. And I think it's a, it's a testament that our faculty are very engaged, they're very active in their disciplines, they're operating at the highest levels of competitiveness within their academic disciplines. And uh, you know, not, not only to be able to uh, publish results in peer-reviewed uh, journals and uh, juried exhibitions and performances as would be appropriate for the discipline. Uh, that's, that's a remarkable achievement in and of itself, but, but to be able to uh, produce scholarly work that is, uh, is deemed competitive enough to receive funding at this level, I think uh, speaks volumes about the, the quality that's going on here. And so we're very proud of that. Uh, some other uh, noteworthy faculty accomplishments. We had, we had four non-provisional patents issued this past year. I think that's a record for one year. Uh, we had three NSF uh, Early Career Award winners. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that's a record for us. Uh, we've had a few Early Career Award winners in the past, but I don't think ever three in one year. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a highly competitive award. Uh, from the National Science Foundation, and, uh, along with one Phil, Fulbright Fellow. So th these are, you know, there's a lot of ways that, that uh, faculty scholarship can be recognized. Uh, and as uh, has been pointed out already, uh, the size of the grant is not necessarily indicative of the level of impact that is produced. Uh, but to be reviewed on a national level uh, by peers across the country and deemed worthy of, uh, of recognition like this, that's, that's the real gold standard. And, uh, and so we're very proud of everybody on campus that's participating in these and helping us reach those goals. So, the, you know, the, the $40 million goal it <clears throat> is certainly a worthy goal. 
and very aspirational for us. <clears throat> but we want we never want to lose sight of the fact that that this is for a purpose. It's not just the money. The money's great, it, it, but it's a it's a vehicle. It's a way that uh, allows us to do the kind of work that makes an impact on the communities that we serve and the students that we develop here at Tennessee Tech. <clears throat> so Research and Creative Inquiry Day, it's always held in the spring. Uh, and some of you have attended this event in the past. Uh, this is generally held in the Hooper Eblen Center. Uh, and we set another new record this past spring. Uh, as you can see here, I mean, these are student projects. Uh, you know, often these are uh, posters that have also been presented at national or even international meetings. But, but it gives the students an opportunity to, to uh, showcase the work that they've done. And, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to, to be present for one of these in the past, I would encourage all the board members to take time to do this. I think it, it'd be a, a few hours well spent. You would really enjoy getting, getting the chance to hear from the students and, and the uh, excitement that they have in, in that discovery process and, and the pride that they take in their work. I think it would, it would certainly make your day. <clears throat> Eagle Works, which is our Shark Tank competition annually, uh, has awarded over $120,000, uh, I think, cumulative directly to students to aid their businesses. Uh, the, a couple of patents have been awarded to students uh, over that time period, and I think one is still pending. Uh, of, of the five total award winners uh, to date uh, that went on to attempt their startup business, uh, all five of these are still in business and have collectively created uh, 12 full-time jobs and 25 part-time jobs. So, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and uh, of innovation is very much alive and well on campus. And we don't talk about it too much anymore. We were for, for a while, but we, you know, along with helping develop students uh, to be great employees, and we work with a lot of businesses uh, around the region and around the state in helping them find the talent that they're looking for uh, to, to drive their business opportunities. We also want to work with our students to create their own jobs in many cases. Uh, you know, a lot of them have the, uh, the drive and potential to be that, that uh, successful entrepreneur. Uh, and, and whether they start their own business or they end up working for somebody else, that entrepreneurial spirit is something that's very important within that business enterprise. And so wherever they land, they make they make that enterprise better because they're innovative, they're creative, and they've, they've been able to exercise that uh, and develop that talent here on campus. And Eagle Works is a great example of that kind of program that helps them develop those skills and, and be able to, to pitch those ideas uh, in, a, uh, in a fairly uh, competitive and uh, intense way to folks that uh, can critique those ideas. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, the last thing I'll end with here is a pretty significant opportunity we've had to, to partner with the Upper Cumberland Development District. It's actually a multi-partner activity. Uh, there's about uh, four or five of us here along with Tennessee Tech, the Upper Cumberland Development District, the uh, uh, Cookville Putnam County Chamber of Commerce, and another partner or two that uh, came together to uh, win a grant from from the state called Empower Upper Cumberland. This is a it's actually a 25 million dollar award. Uh, the subcontract to Tennessee Tech is about a million dollars of that uh, for our uh, piece of this partnership. Uh, but the goal of the grant is to eliminate poverty uh, in uh, in the Upper Cumberland. So it's a, it's a very ambitious goal, but it's, a, it's very much needed and impactful. And uh, actually, Dr. Taylor is leading the Tennessee Tech effort uh, in this regard. Uh, and uh, we're excited about the, the relationships that we have within the Upper Cumberland to make a difference in our local communities. Uh, but we're also very excited about the, uh, the intellectual capability that we have here at Tennessee Tech to, to be a meaningful partner in something that can be this impactful. So we're excited about that. Uh, it, it fits obviously into our uh, rural reimagined grand challenge as well, trying to make a difference in a lot of these rural communities uh, around the state of Tennessee. So uh, 
so, uh, Madam Chairman, that's, uh, that's my report on research. I'll be glad to answer any questions that I can. Thank you, President Odom. Anyone have any questions? I don't have a question. I do want to comment, though, on the event last night. I, first of all, thank you for giving us a chance to participate and listen in on uh, your top researchers and their work. Each one of them spent a minute or so describing their work, and it was diverse and passionate and really interesting. And for many of us, they, they were in fields that we don't have anything to do with, but we were able to, I was able to follow most of it, so I felt very good about that. But I came away saying, not only were those really interesting projects, but it, it sounded to me like everything that people were working on was something that helps people or our environment. I didn't, I didn't hear anything that, forgive me for saying this, but it sounded esoteric. Um, it all sounded like it was really meaningful research and, and our faculty clearly had some passion for what they're doing and uh, both one-on-one -on -one and as a group, they were just really, that was very impressive. And I wanna thank you for giving us that opportunity. Well, I appreciate those of you that were, were there last night. And, and I think your comment is, is extremely uh, important actually. Uh, you know, as we talk a lot about being a research university, being a, a, a Carnegie R2, and that's, that's really important. But, um, you know, I think we are differentiated in a very good way from the larger uh, Research One universities around the country in that, in that point that you just made, uh, and, and that's regarding the impact of the research. Uh, and there's certainly nothing wrong with basic research, uh, and we do a, a, quite a bit of basic research on campus. But I think the niche that we can we can fill most effectively that a lot of our ones don't, and that's that that shorter horizon uh, kind of impact value for research that you know you might call it more applied work in some cases. Uh, I tend to think of it as more of a of a, you know five to ten year horizon as opposed to a twenty or thirty year horizon type of work, uh, and. The, the, the nice thing, I think, for us, one, we can see the benefit of that pretty quickly uh, with the communities that we serve, but probably even more importantly, the student involvement in this uh, can impact their lives even quicker because the students see the difference that they're making very quickly, uh, and it, I think it empowers them and changes the trajectory of their future careers because they... Uh, that they like to make a difference, they want to make a difference, and so if they can see that in the, you know, the two or three years that they're here on campus, and and they can leave here saying, hey, I, I was part of that, I was part of making a difference in, in that community, or I helped I helped figure out that problem, a solution to that problem, it's a, that's a very powerful th thing educationally, for them, and so I, I think I'm very proud of the fact that Tennessee Tech is, is really emerging in that that niche of research, I think, uh, and, and filling a, a void that a lot of other institutions uh, either don't or can't. Dr. Oldham, I know um, I was honored to follow you, and this is Oldham at a presentation to local um, families who were considering Tennessee Tech, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, and the topic that I presented on was side-by-side -side research for students and faculty, and it's something that parents really you know, it's, it, like you said, it has a reality-based sound to it, like it's an application right away of what they're learning, and, uh, and it was very engaging. They were very excited about that. I had a question about Dr. Perkins, um, who's coming in as a consultant. Um, I know that, so long-range planning is what we do here, but I know that the faculty are very concerned short-term about making sure that we have a research office that's really functioning because these great numbers that we're all seeing right now are the result of work that has been going on. And at any moment, bumps in the processing of research can shoot that down in a year, and we certainly want to keep that trajectory up. So does he have, will he have the um, capacity to fill out the staff? Uh, or, are you going to be working with him? And will he be working with faculty to maybe figure out what the shape of the research office will need to be coming forward? 
<laughs> yeah, I appreciate the question because that's exactly what his role was going to be uh, as, a, as a highly experienced professional in the research enterprise at multiple institutions, uh, you know, all, all R1 institutions, mostly at University of Alabama and at Auburn. Um, Carl will come in with a, a lot of that background, and, and my charge to him will be for him to help us navigate where we are now versus where we need to be uh, on the short term and long term. So really, over the next uh, six to nine months, to uh, first and foremost, uh, make sure that the trains run on time and uh, all, the, all, the, all the nuts and bolts are fitting together. So he, he, the first challenge for him is going to be, okay, what's working? Where do we need to focus resources uh, most effectively? What are the most urgent things to take care of? And uh, we do have some vacancies uh, currently in uh, the research office, and we're, we're continuing to pursue uh, filling those vacancies uh, with all due haste. Uh, but Carl will have an opportunity to kind of help guide us through that so that we are making sure to address the most urgent things first and uh, then ultimately set the stage for the next uh, research VP to come in and have a platform to, to launch from. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Olin, I could echo the two previous comments, uh, Chair, and, um, and I wanted to say that this morning I was had breakfast at a very active table with faculty members, and one of their concerns was uh, the fact that, A, we didn't have leadership, and then second was the people who actually fill out the forms and do the paperwork were um, not there either, so it was causing a problem of getting reports out. So maybe you could speak to that and t t tell us what you're planning to do to make sure that problem is solved. Yeah, as, as I indicated, we have some vacancies that have been, we've been trying to fill for the last uh, few months and we're, we're pursuing those pretty aggressively. We've got some offers pending now to fill some of those vacancies. Uh, and we'll continue to pursue those. Uh, I think Dr. Pinkert will provide the leadership that we need over the, over the short term uh, to make sure that we're heading in the right direction. And, uh, but uh, yeah, we're filling all those gaps as quick as we can. On, on the other hand, we, we do have additional uh, human resources around campus in a distributed format that, uh, that we can pull on as needed uh, initially to make sure that we get things done. Uh, and so, to my knowledge, we haven't held anything up at this point uh, uh, from leaving campus in terms of a proposal, but uh, my goal would be to, that never, we never come close to that. So we'll, we'll keep uh, making sure that we get things out. Just as a point of discussion, maybe for Mr. Stites on that. One of the things that we're, the faculty, of course, will, will want to have input on is what are those, um, those roles be beneath the director look like, and do, do we have access to market money to keep those? That has been a big problem. We can't keep people in those jobs, and we have not been quickly, we have not quickly pivoted to the market rates, nor the type of employment. So for instance, last night at the meeting, I met with somebody who was formerly in that staff who helped me with my grant for the string project. And um, that person is now working at home in uh, Cookville for Stony Brook, doing a better job, um, a more rewarding job of the types that sh she was doing for more pay, but still here in Cookville. So we need to pivot quickly, I mean immediately, we need to ramp that up, and that's been a big challenge for us. Yeah, so, and it's not just in the research arena, we're, we're seeing it in other parts of campus, and, and most of you that are that are in business or uh, related fields can can uh, understand this. You know, we've we've seen a lot of changes, and I was going to hit on this later this afternoon in my report, but but uh, give you a little bit of preview of that. So what we're seeing overall on campus is a, is a lot more salary pressure overall, competitively, uh, and particularly in strategic positions, uh, and also the uh, you know after COVID the uh, the role of remote work in the overall workplace. And uh, so there's a, there's a lot of things that we're working through uh, universally across campus, uh, but we're seeing it particularly in areas like uh, uh, information technology skills as well as the research office, 
uh, th you know, areas where uh, remote work is much more uh, feasible in nature. Uh, and so we're, we're not just competing on a local or regional level anymore for talent. We're really competing nationally for talent. And so uh, that puts pressure on our uh, salary uh, uh, scales as well. So, I mean, th those are the challenges going forward. And, and uh, you know, we don't have all the answers yet, but we're working on them. Any other comments or questions? I would concur. Uh, it's not just in the higher education world that uh, many of those challenges are being felt in the current current economy. economy. So we didn't have any action items from you. So if there's no other comments or questions, thank you, President Odom. Thank you very much. And then finally, uh, on our agenda, we have uh, Dr. Kevin Braswell here with us today. He may be the last one on the agenda, Dr. Braswell, but certainly a very, very important part of our agenda as far as the future of this university. And he's going to give us the update on university advancement in the end of the year report for 2022. Chair Rose, members of the board, President Oldham, thanks so much for the opportunity to bring a brief update on university advancement. Think with me for a moment about a tech graduation. You have it in your mind. Maybe you have a favorite part. Perhaps it's the pomp and circumstance. Maybe it's the processional. Maybe it's laughter or tears or knowing looks. President Oldham makes some memorable comments at every tech graduation. One about our institution that we would do well to remember he says that the greatest compliment a parent can give the university is to entrust the education of their daughter or son to us. Agreed. That being the case, perhaps the second greatest compliment is for alumni and friends to give to Tennessee Tech to impact our students. In the last fiscal year that closed on June 30th of this calendar year, I'm very pleased to report an increase in the number of alumni and friends who gave to Tech, 4,885 compared to 4,393 the previous year, an increase of 11%. More broadly, reflecting on the last 10 years, the trend at Tech and indeed at most higher education institutions is larger gifts from fewer donors. Let's look at this from a monetary standpoint. We recorded the second consecutive year in which commitments exceeded 20 million. The total for fiscal year 21-22 was 20.96 million, with new donors contributing 7.13 million. The bar graph before you shows progress, and it points to possibility as well. Comparing the bars on the right side of the graph with those on the left, it's clear that we're making noteworthy progress on the fundraising front. However, we have only scratched the surface of what is possible. Our single greatest challenge, single greatest challenge presently is to sustain and grow the progress that's been made to date. To that end, multiple data points, and President Oldham and I have talked about this, those data points suggest that we're gonna have to have a serious conversation about some sort of sensible, balanced investment in university advancement to realize our full philanthropic potential. We have incredible advantages. We have a great story. We have a growing, vibrant local economy. We have a healthy number of new major gift donors joining our efforts, including one this week who made a seven-figure commitment thanks to great work by President Oldham and our Director of Development, Bobby Taylor. We have a terrific team in university advancement, and we have the best volunteer leaders in Tennessee. Let's turn now to campaign as a topic of conversation. It's been more than three years since Tennessee Tech Tomorrow campaign concluded successfully. The time is now right to move toward another comprehensive campaign, and we are focused intensely on getting ready for it. Whatever its weaknesses, a campaign is still the best vehicle to grow our overall endowment and to provide a boost to our university community, especially our students. The fruits of a campaign 
that is resources that touch nearly every area of our university help make the difference between a good and truly great university. With regard to campaign theme, focus, and emphases, we continue to work closely with multiple campus stakeholders. For example, several focus groups have been convened to collect feedback and perspective on tech's present status, as well as future aspirations. We have also collected feedback from a benchmarking survey of 26 peer and peer aspirant institutions and achieved an impressive response rate of 70%. In the next few weeks, our Martz and Lundy partners plan to conduct interviews with several dozen constituents to test potential campaign themes. Additionally, an online survey will be distributed to as many as 15,000 alumni and friends. The survey will do two things. First, it will gauge their feelings about the university, and then second, it will better assess their willingness and eagerness to participate in the campaign. President Oldham and I look forward to sharing the comprehensive results of our partnership with Martz and Lundy by early next year. Relative to campaign timeline and execution, we are still in the quiet phase of the planning effort, but we're continuing to work with a sense of urgency on a full slate of fundraising priorities, as you'll see on the next slide. We have the several capital projects at the top, a heavy emphasis on scholarships, special initiatives to ensure that our students have a wonderful tech experience. When President Oldham invited me to join him in this work in the spring of 2015, he asked an enduring question. How will you know if you are successful? To be sure, there are metrics galore in advancement and fundraising work, and we like our metrics and data. We study them. We learn from them. We are both motivated by and sometimes dismayed by them. They inform our strategy and help us evaluate at the same time. But metrics alone do not tell the full success story. Success occurs on many levels, including individual and organizational levels. Trustee Alcott referred to side-by-side -side learning or faculty-mentored research earlier. That's a form of success. Maybe a shy student from Coffee County who is very reticent about coming to Tennessee Tech at all. She goes on to travel abroad with confidence and presents original research at a regional or national conference. That side-by-side -side learning is a form of success. At the university level, success can come in many forms as well. When we're a little less tuition dependent because our endowment has grown to 250 million or more, we will have been successful. When every prospective student with financial need has that need met, we will have been successful. When we name our flagship college and other colleges and co-curricular areas, we will certainly have been successful. And when we have expanded our donor base year over year for several consecutive years, we will have been successful. Finally, and this comports well with what a university is, comprehensive by nature, when the benefits of philanthropy extend to every area of campus, we will have been successful. Madam Chair, we've achieved to date a measure of success, but we are far, far from being satisfied. We're restless. Stay tuned. We're just getting started, and I'll be happy to field questions. Thank you, Dr. Braswell. Any, any questions? Comments? When you're asking or talking about an investment in advancement, we know that that means us committing money uh, to that. So is that something where you're setting a goal? When we get to this level, we will have justified the need for more staff. Do we need more staff to get to the next level? And what does that look like for you as far as your planning? I'm assuming that's what you're talking about when you talked about an investment. Yes, it is, Trustee Alcott. To put it simply, I feel like we have come about as far as we can. That is nearly quintupling the numbers since I arrived without additional investment. So that does mean staff and other resources to support our programming. Uh, so that's what we'd be looking for, but we make data-based, evidence-guided decisions, 
and Martz and Lundy is a top shelf firm, and I'm sure they'll come back with some recommendations. And my only request is, as a campus community, that we have a, a thoughtful conversation about that. I certainly recognize that advancement is hardly the only unit clamoring for more resources, but I am looking forward to the conversation. I feel, I feel compelled to say that as much as we love pledges and we love in-kind gifts because those are amazing and we've had some of the most amazing, generous offers of in-kind gifts, but cash does a lot of good. And this past year, it appears that you have blown out your cash numbers, your uh, outright giving, I guess it's called. And that is, uh, I, I, I can remember many years sitting on the foundation board where we wrung our hands about, yeah, these, these assets we're getting are really great, but they come with obligations, and how do we fund those? And uh, this was a year where you really blew it out on the outright giving, and I don't want to get, I don't want the, the day to get away without complimenting and you and your entire team who have done so much to make that happen. So thank you. You pried those dollars out of people's little hands, didn't you? Chair Cold Harper, live I, hands. They aren't dead because they're, they're giving it outright. I, I greatly appreciate that comment. Our cash uh, numbers are up. That's a tremendous outcome. It's thanks to many people, uh, certainly the staff, but President Oldham is phenomenal as a fundraiser. Those numbers are skewed a bit by one particular individual, but even so, cash was up. But think about it this week. We had a new donor fly via private plane to visit this campus, and there comes a point in time where that donor, whoever he or she is, sits with the president and the CEO and takes their measure of that individual. They're either inspired or they're not, and there's none better than President Oldham. I, I disagree with that. <laughs> Uh, but I but I do enjoy it, despite uh, my upbringing, where I thought I would never uh, ask anybody for money. Uh, but uh, no, it's great to meet these individuals, and I appreciate Kevin's remarks. But uh, it's it's he, he's got a great team, and uh, they do a phenomenal job of uh, setting the stage. And uh, I'm glad to play a part in it. Thank you, President Odom, and thank you, Dr. Braswell. And I agree, I think it's a team of everybody working together. Fantastic job. So with that, Chairman Harper, we have finished our work. Well, I actually have one no. more quick announcement. Okay. As it turns out, it, this is always the risk you run when you start naming people who were instrumental in something that was so successful as that video we saw earlier. And it turns out that I only got the names of the people from the enrollment management uh, area of the university, and I did not include the folks from communications and marketing who were clearly instrumental in producing that amazing video. So I don't have your names. I'm sorry. I, the the way that this came about, I've, I'm afraid I didn't get the names of the folks involved in communications and marketing. Perhaps we can recognize you at our next meeting, but I just want to thank you all as well for your help in the recruitment for this freshman class and this, this amazing piece of work that you all did with that video that I think we're going to see a lot more of before it's over. So now, Madam Chairman, I'll, I'll stop. We have concluded our work, Chairman Harper. Thank you. So if you are adjourned, then I will ask that we we have a 15-minute break. So let's be back here at 10 o'clock on the dot, and we will start our um, Audit and Business Committee meeting. Thank you.
his Okay, are we ready to get started? Thank you. Be it noted, we're starting 10 minutes late, but that's okay. Just didn't want it all laid on me. Um, I call to order the um, Audit and Business Committee, and we'll start by the approval of the minutes. Roll Everybody call. has had the uh, minutes. Mr. Stein, yes. roll call. What? Roll call. Yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Should put my glasses on, shouldn't I? <laughs> That's okay. I'd Trudy. like to call to order the meeting and secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. Here. Can you simultaneously hear and speak to the committee members? Yes, I can. Please identify any persons present in the location from which you are calling. Oh, I'm by myself. Please confirm that you received the committee materials in advance. Yes, I did. Thank you, sir. Trustee Lynn. Here. Can you simultaneously hear and speak to the committee members? Yes, yes, I can. Please identify any persons present in the location from which you're calling. In the room I'm in, I'm by myself. Next and, door is my daughter. And please confirm that you received the committee materials in advance. I did. All right. And Trustee Stites. Here. All right, all present. Thank you very much. Okay, the minutes have been placed in diligent for your review. If there's no discussion, can I get a motion to approve the minutes for the June 23rd, 2022 meeting? So moved. Thank you, Fred. Second? Second. Thomas, thank you. Secretary, please take the roll call vote, please. Trustee Lowry? Aye. Trustee Lynn? Aye. Trustee Stites? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Financial update. Dr. Stinson will give us an uh, update on the university finances based on the fall semester enrollments. Dr. Stinson. Thank you. So I wanted to share with the committee, we have finished our uh, financial closeout of our fiscal year uh, 22, and uh, this is a, a high level of where we ended our year. We started the year with a fund balance of uh, 30, uh, about $30.7 million. We ended the year with uh, around $25 million. And I know that sounds like a fairly large number, but actually uh, we got some allocations that go against it and some carry forwards. So we do, uh, we are required to allocate fund balance to cover our working capital. That includes things like prepaid expenses, petty cash, accounts receivable, several things like that is included in our working capital and then an allocation for encumbrances and that's purchase orders it's purchase orders that we had in place at june 30th but the goods had not been received uh, at june the 30th and so we needed to carry that obligation forward we also uh, ended the year with funds uh, sufficient to cover the required uh, two to five percent uh, fund balance uh, that is two to five percent of our ENG revenues, and uh, it is actually the four million nine is actually t around two and a half percent of those revenues, and that's revenues based on our proposed budget. <clears throat> We also had some unspent budgets that have been requested as carry forwards and we'll be looking through those. Some of those uh, will need to be carried forward. I uh, don't know if it'll be the whole uh, $3 million. And then we had special fee carry forwards that amounted to about uh, 12, close to $12 million that we will be rebudgeting into our October budget. So uh, moving into uh, looking at and planning for our October revised budget, uh, we did some early uh, looks at our uh, revenues compared to what we had budgeted in the proposed budget. And it appears that uh, 
our net increase in revenues, and it is an increase in, in projected revenues, is about $545,000. And if you look at that uh, uh, net of uh, summer school, without the summer school revenues in there, it's about $386,000. One of the things that we'll be looking at with our revised budget is we know that we've got some cost increases as a result of inflation. I looked at the August numbers in our uh, <clears throat> energy is up about 23%. So we'll be looking to do some uh, additional budgets for our utilities in the October budget. And we also looking at the CPI and it was up about 8.3%. Uh, <clears throat> in August, so uh, we'll be taking a look at, at uh, other things along that line. I also wanted to give uh, give you a update on our enrollment analysis. And this is uh, different from what Karen Lycan had presented this morning, because this is based on FTE, stu uh, full-time student full-time equivalent students. And that's the way that we project our revenues using those numbers. There's not a tremendous amount of difference between headcount and FTE because we don't have a tremendous number of part-time students, but there, there is some differences. Uh, we were actually, uh, a couple numbers that I want to point out, first-time freshmen, uh, we had in proposed budget, uh, we were at 1761 in our actuals. We're at 2050, and so that was an increase of 289 student or FTE full-time equivalents. Our transfers were down uh, over what we had projected by 109, and our dual enrollment was up uh, by 38. And dual enrollment is one of those areas where. Uh, the students are paying a, a rate that is determined by the grant that they get through THEC, and so it's not a large revenue item for us. Uh, returning students, uh, undergraduate and graduate, we were down about 290 FTEs. Overall, we were up 11 FTEs between what we had projected for our proposed budget and what our actual fall enrollments were. So I thought it was uh, some pretty good projections. We worked uh, really closely with enrollment management and with the graduate office uh, to put together those projections. It looks like they did a pretty good job. Set the mark so that they'll have um, they'll have to beat it in the future and that may be difficult with those estimates. Dr. I have a question, please. Um, who's responsible for the undergraduate transfer students and the returning students? Who's responsible for getting those numbers to where they need to be? Well, Johnny, I'm going to say that we all are, but uh, primarily the uh, enrollment uh, is uh, handled by enrollment management. And I know that uh, going forward, we uh, our next step, especially with returning students, is to work on uh, what is, uh, you know, on our retention of students that we have already enrolled. And that's a part of that returning students. But we also had, with returning students, we had a few more students who graduated than we had anticipated when we put together the proposed budget. I'm just curious, are there any direct reasons why the, the number, those two numbers are down, the undergraduate and the, new, and the returning students? I'm sorry, Tom, would you put? I'm sorry, is, is there any specific reasons why the undergraduate transfers and the returning students' numbers were just so much lower than predicted? Well, I think on the uh, transfers, you know, the community colleges have had a tremendous decline in their student enrollments, and so of course that's going to impact us. Uh, I know that uh, enrollment management has put together some uh, additional steps uh, to recruit out of the uh, 
out of the community colleges and uh, we were looking at their enrollment numbers and one of the schools that uh, we tend to get transfer students from did have a positive enrollment for this fall, fall of 22. But they've had, they had last year, community colleges had a decline in enrollment of about 21% and that does affect us. Yeah, I, I would say to that, particularly on the transfer thing, the, uh, for the most part, it's very understandable. And uh, in the case of, of the returning students, uh, you know, the fact that they're mostly graduating and going on, it's a, it's a good thing. It's an efficiency uh, improvement on campus. So, but uh, I, I think it does point out that it, just by overall, you know, the, the, the fact that they're within 11 FTE uh, out of... Uh, Nearly nine thousand. That's pretty. It's pretty good. I can't imagine. I can't believe we were that close. To be honest, but but the uh, inside stuff on a couple of those are, are they're tricky. That's I think that's the bottom line. Doctor, uh, Doctor, do oh. just a quick question on the on the graduating uh, more, graduating more or more more students graduating. Uh, is it too early to say that's an impact of the flat fee? change we made some time ago or or is that actually having a an impact uh, it, that's a really good question fred i i'm not sure if i can tie it directly to the flat fee but i we do know that the flat fee has has had a difference in increasing the number of credit hours that students are taking each semester it has it has moved the needle there <clears throat> and so you know in all of our predictions and modeling we we do anticipate over time to to graduate students quicker uh, and so whether we're already seeing that that's the tricky part I'm not sure that this is part of that but uh, we, we also know that we're getting a lot more students and have for the past few years we're getting more students in the in as freshmen with a significant number of dual enrollment credits uh, they're coming in with a semester more worth of work already uh, to their credit and so some of them are graduating early uh, regardless of the flat rate so it, it's all working together uh, I, I, there's no question that the flat rate has been helpful in this regard but I don't know if I can tie it directly to that yet Got it. Thanks. Dr. Oldham um, one of the things that was concerned us as a faculty uh, in recruiting was the Tennessee promise several years ago, kind of threw us a big curveball. Is the bloom off the rose on that too a little bit? Is that why we're seeing, you know, possibly lower enrollment at the community colleges and we got a good freshman class? Uh, I, I tend to think so, uh, Dan. I'm not, I'd be, it'd be hard for me to prove that, but, but my gut tells me that that's the case. I think the shine is worn off a little bit, and, and I think COVID probably uh, disrupted that substantially, uh, not only just from uh, enrollment behaviors by students, but also the, uh, uh, you know, the job opportunities for students in that population uh, have, have changed the competitive nature of that decision that students are making and so uh, it's uh, I don't think the Tennessee promise is quite as attractive to as many students as it once was but but and, and it to your point uh, I haven't thoroughly analyzed it yet but but uh, a lot of the uh, I mean, we, we saw a significant increase in freshmen here, nearly 24% increase over last year. Uh, there were, a, you know, maybe two or three other campus, four-year campuses that also saw an increase in freshmen, uh, maybe not to the same extent, but uh, substantial enough. A at the same time, uh, overall, almost universally, the community colleges continued to decline in, in enrollments. And so, I, I think this is this is a is probably indicative of what you what you suggest, but I don't know that. I want to understand this number of 290 loss on returning students. Are, what per, what number in that 290 are graduates? Are you saying the graduates are in that number? That is correct. That is a uh, uh, decrease in both undergraduate and graduate. 
And I don't know, I don't have that information, Johnny, but I will uh, see if I can get that information for you. Well, if that includes the graduates, I could see why it'd be a high number because we graduated, how many did we graduate last spring? I, I think last year we, total graduate, which is about 2,500 uh, students graduated at, at some level, uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees, uh, which, uh, uh, and I don't want to speak for, for Dr. Stinson, but I think when, when her folks put together these projections, uh, it, it, obviously, it's based on past history about about uh, you know the percentage of, of of current students that we expect to graduate or to leave for other reasons, and so it, it it's all based on that past history. And to whatever extent that past history is is clearly indicative of what you might expect in the future, then you'll be you'll be closer to correct. Uh, in this particular case, for whatever reason, uh, you know, the past history wasn't exactly uh, accurate. Although, you know, even even if you're off uh, 290 out of nearly 6,000, that's not that's not terrible. Uh, but uh, and again, that's, you know, when they're putting these together, it's just a it's a way of trying to predict uh, close enough so that we can get some estimates on, to budget to, uh, so that you you. You're at least in the right ballpark, uh, and from that standpoint, I think they did a pretty good job. But, but it, it does show that these these variables can be pretty volatile and uh, and unpredictable at times. So what I hear you saying is that the students that returned to the sophomore class, the junior class, and senior class, minus the graduates, is this number primarily? No, I think, I, and I could be wrong, but I think. Uh, they expected to see uh, what uh, 5,991 5, students from last year continue into this year, and we saw 290 less. Which it doesn't say, you know, for what reason they are not longer here. We we probably had some additional graduates, uh, additional graduations, and and we may have seen some additional, uh, uh, you know, loss through non-retention. For other reasons, we, you know, and I don't, I don't think we know that at this point. Is that correct, Dr. Stinson? Uh, that is correct. Although, you know, uh, people back behind me passed me a little note that said that our uh, stu uh, students that graduated in the summer was higher than than what we had estimated. And so, when we're putting these together, we're doing this in April. Uh, for a graduation in May, and most of the students for the spring would have already applied. We'll know about them, although I don't think we refuse to graduate somebody if they have all their credits and just haven't applied. You know, we'll try to do it even if it's the last minute. The summer it does affect our, our numbers, and uh, that is one of the things that we'll be digging into with enrollment management and with the graduate studies. But I do know that we had, in uh, graduate students, we had quite a few uh, students during COVID who uh, went ahead and, and worked on graduate degrees. A lot of those were master's degrees and they were only, they were ready to graduate this past year. And, and so I think we had more students in master's degree graduating than, uh, than we had anticipated in the spring, too. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I, I know what you need is one more thing to think about, but do we have a way, a mechanism to follow up with a student who was an undergraduate student this year and doesn't come back next year? Do we, do we have, is, is the advising pro, does the advising process follow up on that or is there something that we can do? Uh, I'm not sure I'm the best one to talk about this, and I don't, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to know who to call on that might give an answer. But well, it, and but you're exactly right. So I, I'll just say, you know, one thing that we have, we, I, I don't know if struggle is the right word, but, but uh, some institutions will attempt to do exit interviews with students when they're departing, and that there's somewhat of an art to this because a lot of times when a student uh, leaves for whatever reason, uh, they might tell you a reason, 
uh, it may or may not be the actual reason. It may be the easiest thing that they can tell you. So it may be, they may say financial or when it's really a boyfriend or something else. Uh, and so, you know, we, it, it, it requires a little bit of skill to uncover what the real issues might be. Uh, we do, through, through Launchpad, I know with, uh, particularly with freshmen, uh, we will keep track of them pretty closely. And, and to, to uh, I think, quite an extent, a lot of the colleges and departments, uh, to, to varying degrees, will pay close attention to, to their majors. And if, uh, if, if someone... Uh, you know, is leaving or, or disappearing for some reason. They'll, they'll, they'll usually follow up on that, but I don't know that we do a good enough job of collecting that information centrally uh, to fully understand it. I, I'm just thinking about what a success story you've had by doing all of this personal follow-up with recruitment, and I wonder if there's anything that we could do along those same lines with... Um, with retentions, it, just a question. It's not a suggestion that you change anything, but just a question to think about as you go forward, um, as you make further enhancements. I'm, I'm just so blown away by what you all were able to do with recruitment, particularly with that hands-on, you know, personal cards, letters, all that stuff. I think that has to have made a huge difference. And I'm just wondering if there's a there's an equivalent to retention, but anyway, just something to think about for the future. I don't think it's anything you need to do anything with so, today. So we did this a few years ago, and it's probably worth repeating now because uh, we haven't done it in a while. We actually we hired a group, a uh, consulting group that's pretty skilled at this, to do telephone surveys of non-returning students. <clears throat> so, um, you know, and some of them are hard to track down, but uh, they, did a, they did a pretty good job of of tracking down a number of non-returning students and, and asking them that question, you know, what was your experience like? Uh, you know, why didn't you come back uh, to Tennessee Tech? And, uh, you know, the summary of that was it was actually good and bad. The, 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 the good news is that uh, they almost universally said they had a great experience at Tennessee Tech. There wasn't anything real negative about their experience that uh, drove them to to go somewhere else or drop out of school or whatever. Um, the bad news is that uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't really anything clearly identifiable for us to fix uh, in that regard. Uh, you know, it was, it was like, I, you know, I needed to get closer to home for personal reasons. Uh, you know, I needed to get a job. Uh, you know, it, it was life. It was life issues that uh, are really, to a large extent, outside of our control. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, I, I don't. I, I shouldn't assume that that's the, still the case, uh, but uh, until I get some information otherwise, that's that's my assumption. Uh, one of the things that we do is uh, the students who have pre-registered in the spring. We start working those numbers early. Uh, we being from the finance side of, of things, you know, to make sure that, you know, they're coming, they're following through, and they don't end up at the last minute not being able to come because of some kind of financial reason. And, and so my thought, I've been thinking about this some, is that we can, uh, we know who those students are who have pre-registered, and, and we know who the students are currently, and match those two together and see which students have not registered that are sophomores going to be juniors and, and uh, freshmen going to be sophomores and those types of things. And so uh, I think we do have a uh, potential data source there and, and and then it's figuring out like as the president said you know what are the reasons and sometimes you can't necessarily get the students to tell you exactly what it is but uh, but I think we got some potential there okay thank you for the discussion there's no action required now so we'll move on to the next item master plan amendment and dr. Stenson will present the changes to the master plan. Okay, before we do that, Johnny, I'm gonna just, I just wanted to give the, uh, this committee and the board 
uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the impact of some of the changes that we have worked with you all and you all have approved. So we had this uh, flat rate tuition model. This is our third year. Uh, our cumulative uh, impact of that has been about six and a half million dollars. We also had at the same time a change in a reduction to our domestic out-of-state tuition. And, and I know the president talked a little bit earlier this morning. We'll take a look at our international, but it has had an, improve, uh, an impact on the number of out-of-state students that we enroll. So uh, I did want to share that positive piece of news. It seems like from the my standpoint, I get to do more negative than positive. So thank you very much. Now we'll uh, go to the master plan. All right. So uh, master plan amendment. So we do have two modifications to our master plan uh, for the committee's consideration and, uh, to, and to pass it on to the full board uh, for approval. And the first one is to Crawford Hall. And I'm going to talk about the master plan, and then I'm going to be talking about some uh, these a little bit more with the, uh, the capital budget. But uh, as we, the more we got into uh, the programming for our proposed uh, classroom building, which would be on the quad and, and would be where the Matthew Daniels building is now, we realized that uh, the cost to renovate Crawford and the fact that it was not going to give us exactly what we wanted, it made more sense to propose uh, a demolition of Crawford Hall. And Crawford Hall, as a reminder, is the residence hall that is still on the quad. We only have one residence hall that's still on the quad. And, and so that would be the one. And it would give us an opportunity to have a larger footprint uh, for a new building uh, by demolition of Crawford Hall. And then the second uh, modification to the master plan is the Crossville uh, property. And I think, Dr. Oldham, you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. So <clears throat> just so the board understands sort of the sequence here that we have to follow, in order for us to, uh, as an institution, to consider uh, acquisition of property uh, or to build a, a new facility, for that matter, it uh, the state requires that to be part of our master plan, okay? So hence, that's why we're, uh, we're putting before the board entertainment of an amendment to our current master plan to accommodate these two uh, projects, the, uh, the uh, Crawford Hall change as well as the, uh, the Crossville property. Now, you, you probably recall that uh, we, we informed the board uh, at, at a recent board meeting that uh, through the, we had this opportunity uh, to acquire this property in Crossville, the, the uh, trade of plane building. It's about a, uh, well, this says 120,000 square feet uh, at uh, $3.2 million. In order to, to make the transaction work, we needed to go ahead and process that through the foundation, which we've subsequently done. So the foundation, uh, the Tennessee Tech University Foundation currently owns the building in Crossville, uh, but we wanted to make sure the board was aware we would be coming back to you uh, for approval for the university to acquire the building from the foundation. Uh, the state subsequently in this year's budget has uh, provided us with uh, three and a half million dollars of recurring appropriation to support the purchase uh, of the building and the maintenance and uh, and programming that would be done in the uh, in that facility in Crossville uh, for years to come, and so. But in order for us to have that conversation uh, later in the agenda uh, this morning, we first of all need to get the uh, uh, the uh, master plan amended to accommodate that uh, that purchase. So that's. Uh, it, it's a little confusing, probably. I hope it. I hope I helped clarify it a little bit. But, but that's what this is about right now. This particular item is to is to get it uh, approved in our master plan, so that uh, then we can entertain the the option of purchasing it from the foundation. Chair Harper, do you want these in two separate amendments, or 
our motions or should we put them together? I think we can put them together. Is that correct, Lee? I'll, I'll yield to Dr. Stinson or the president on that. I'm not sure that we could, considering that one's a purchase. Well, then let's just go one at a time then, Johnny. I think that's the safest and that okay. way we don't have any problems. All right. Uh, is there any more discussion on the master plan amendment? Just clarification, Crawford Hall is going to be demolished to build back an academic building, and you don't really need more residence halls. Is that correct? <clears throat> So actually, we do need residence halls. The problem is <clears throat> Crawford is is not in good shape to renovate for residence hall uh, long term. It's just not a good use of the the funds. So we, <clears throat> as you as you know, the board approved going forward with the with the JJ Oakley uh, Innovation Center and residence hall. That's in final design stages now. That's that will add about 400 beds to the campus, uh, and that's you know we anticipate that being. Uh, uh, ready by the fall of 25 and we will probably uh, as soon as that's under construction we'll probably go ahead and ask board approval to start on a second phase of that uh, so we, we will be building more bed space on campus but Crawford is just not it's not the right location and it's not the right uh, project for student housing it, it's better suited for this so how many rooms are, or how many beds in Crawford so we know we can plan for like, okay, we're getting 400 more and we're losing how many? So it's, uh, uh, it's 200, 220 something. <laughs> Somewhere around two, 200, uh, with, including the, the first floor, which we weren't able to use all the first floor because we had really thought we would be able to close, go ahead and close it. But uh, it's about 200. Wait, I think I just found it. It says capacity 139 residents. Is that possible? That, that, that's probably currently this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. I just looked up. I found Crawford Hall. Okay. Any more questions? If there's no further discussion, may I get a motion to send the master plan amendment to the board for approval? and place it on the board's regular agenda. So moved. Thank you, Thomas. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Fred. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. The second uh, motion is there's no further discussion on the land acquisition then I, can I get a motion to send the land acquisition from the Tennessee Tech Foundation of property located at 174 4th Street, Crossville, Tennessee, to the board for approval and place it on the board's regular agenda? Is there a motion? So moved. So thank, moved. thank you, Fred. And a second? Second. Thank you, Thomas. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stides. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, the capital budget is the next item. Capital budget for fiscal year 23-24, and Dr. Sensen will present that. Thank you. with the Crawford Hall modification or uh, demolition rather than renovation, it did change the uh, project cost. And so what I am providing here uh, for the uh, committee's consideration is the updated cost. Uh, the, uh, the one piece I wanted to talk about is the match requirement. Be, uh, this would be totally new construction, the demolition of the two, or actually three buildings. and. Uh, and, and reconstruction. So it does increase our match requirement. Uh, match requirements on uh, new construction is 8%. And of that $5,300,000 match requirement, a million seven hundred thousand, uh, a little more than that, but around that amount would be required to be from private donations. Okay, uh, I do want to remind the president that uh, the name of the new facility should somehow include these names, unless we're going to drop those, and I think that's a board decision, is it not? 
Absolutely, the board uh, should weigh in on those. I, but help clarify for me, I, I thought our conversation was around finding ways to memorialize past names, not necessarily on the building itself, but in some in some fashion, and that's fine. I, but if the board wants to take another, I mean, if you want to retain the name uh, on the building, uh, you know, that's okay too. It, it changes the fundraising dynamics, however. Now, I don't think it's my intention to specify which way you do it, but whatever way you choose to do it, it needs to be brought before the board. I think we've decided that we were going to consider that, and I think Lee is working on the, on that now, Johnny. I know there are other buildings. I think I've said my own dorm got torn down and isn't called that anymore. I'd like to think about what we're going to do about those things. And so I think it's an excellent question and one we really need to address holistically. And uh, But I think the president raises a great comment. I asked him in preparing for this meeting, how are we going to raise $1.7 million for a for an academic building on the quad, and I'm, it was pointed out that this is a high-profile building with a lot of opportunity for naming rights. So hopefully, it'll it will attract some investment. Um, but I, I also strongly believe we need to honor the the legacy names of our buildings. Thank you. That that's what I was alluding to. So the. Uh, you want to do the capital? You want to say anything about the capital budget? More than what you said? I don't have anything else on the capital outlay, but I do have some modifications on the capital maintenance that I need to uh, go over with you all. Okay, go ahead with that if you want to. So uh, when we presented our uh, proposed projects for capital maintenance at the June board meeting, uh, I did talk about the fact that uh, we had a couple of projects that, uh, that we were looking at because their uh, projected cost was about 150 percent of what the current uh, dollars in the budget for those two projects. And, and so that's looking at the new priorities four and five, which was the Derryberry uh, upgrades. Uh, it's a multi-phase project, but this particular phase was for the auditorium and, and some lighting, uh, air conditioning, things like that. Uh, so uh, we needed an additional $2.5 million for that. So that's, we've worked with THEC and f and a and, and uh, this is something that they have approved for us to do. The same thing with the Brian Fine Arts Auditorium. Uh, it, uh, we needed an additional $2.3 million for that particular project. So we're doing the same thing with both of those projects. The number three priority that was not included in our June priorities, I had a project for uh, replacing the lighting on intramural fields. When we sent our proposal into THEC, they got some concerns that uh, all of the surrounding facilities is uh, listed on our uh, space uh, inventory as uh, auxiliary space and, and uh, so, you know, as we resolve that question, I didn't want to t take a chance of losing $2 million. So we pulled in another project, and that is our campus-wide building controls project. Uh, and that is uh, a good project for us to pull forward because it does have energy savings, but it also has some pretty significant savings in maintenance cost uh, as a result of that project. Uh, and then uh, as we adjusted some of the dollars, as, as we got a uh, little bit better information on the projects that we were submitting, uh, we did pull in the utilities infrastructure upgrades, uh, which we had not initially included. So we're trying to do quite a bit with our uh, utility infrastructure, getting ready for a project that we uh, have a few years out of uh, doing some modifications to the uh, Dixie Avenue area, uh, and, and these uh, utilities run under that. We don't want to do that project and then tear it up. And at the very bottom, I listed the three projects that we had to take off in order to make this uh, 
work out within the dollars that we're allowed to, to request. And so that included the Foundation Hall upgrades. We'll resubmit it next year. The uh, exterior repairs uh, on the Bryan Fine Arts Building, but also on some area around the Bryan Fine Arts Building. We'll resubmit that one next year. And then the intramural fields light replacement will work uh, to make sure that we can get that through the state. And if we can't, we will be looking for university monies to be able to support that project. It is very much a needed project. So that's where we are on those. Are there any questions for on the capital maintenance projects list? Okay, if not, uh, can I get a motion to send the fiscal year 2023 to fiscal year 2024 revised capital budget request to the board for approval and to place it on the board's regular agenda? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Fred. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Dr. Stenson will present the third quarter fiscal year 22-23 disclosed projects. So we have one project uh, that we would uh, like the committee and the board's approval uh, to submit. It is a football operations center. This is a totally different project from the uh, stadium project that you all have approved. Uh, I think it was at either the March or the June board meeting that you approved that. This one is uh, a project that the foundation's leadership has uh, foundation uh, leadership, the, the chair and, and some of the members of the foundation board have taken on as a fundraiser. And uh, so they have asked that the university submit this as a disclosed project. They have about half of their money raised and uh, they want to start on a design. We cannot move forward with the design until we get it disclosed. Uh, they feel like they need the design in order uh, to do the additional fundraising. Okay, are there any questions about the football operations center? I noticed there's softball coaches offices in this building as well. And uh, I'm just curious about the baseball. Softball offices? Uh, no, uh, I think. Actually, we... if on the second floor, it says a softball head coach, softball assistant coach. Yeah. Let me, in, Let's see, Mark's not here, is he? Okay. Uh, Mark, you might want to address this. Yeah, I, mean, I think I, that's a great idea. I'm just curious about uh, the baseball coaches and their facilities and all. I mean, is, uh, I guess they have adequate facilities. Baseball does have adequate facilities. Okay. All right. I think this is a great idea to incorporate and, and use it because the training facilities are here as well. So it's a, it's a great combination, I think. And we are actually working on a uh, interim movement for possibly the softball coaches because their, their facilities are, are less than optimal. Are there any other questions? If not, can I get a motion to send the third quarter fiscal year 2022-23 disclosed project for the Football Operations Center to the board for approval and place it on the board's regular agenda. So moved. Thank you, Fred. Is there a second? Okay, thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is T2 policy 511-1. Mr. Stites, let me just back you up for half a second, make sure. Did we get a vote on the capital budget and the capital maintenance, the capital outlay and the capital? It was combined as one motion, combined is that one correct? Motion. Okay, that's, that's how I thought it went to, but I want to be sure. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Stites, for interrupting. That's perfectly all right. So you're good with it, what we did? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the policy, uh, TTU policy 511.1, fees, charges, refunds, and adjustments. 
Dr. Stanson. So this this policy, because it involves fees and charges, uh, does have to have this committee and the board's approval. Uh, it is a, a fairly simple update uh, to the policy. It has uh, we have made two modifications, and these are based on a state law, TCA 49.7.1303, which passed in uh, became effective in July. And what it, what the policy modifications do is adds the definition of military affiliate individuals as defined in this law and it also as in accordance with the state law it allows the military affiliated individuals to pay in-state tuition if they are registered at Tennessee Tech and reside outside of the state of Tennessee so it, it, it does give those individuals in-state right to in-state tuition and that's the modifications on the policy are there any questions? Is, is this targeted at, at people who are on duty outside of the state? Or are we trying to bring in more military people, maybe from Kentucky? I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it's targeted at or what the state or our intent. Uh, I'm sorry, Dan, I didn't catch your question because I I'm curious that who this is geared towards. So we're talking about enrolling people at in-state tuition who are not resident here. Is this particularly geared, or I, I was trying to clarify, it, is this perhaps people who are from Tennessee who have been, or are now on an active assignment outside, or maybe they're doing, or are we trying to get like people from Kentucky military bases to come to Tennessee Tech? All right. Uh, it is uh, for uh, military who, residency is actually outside of the state of Tennessee. And, and the law does define who uh, fits the criteria of military affiliated individuals. And uh, Tennessee's done this several times, you know, with uh, provisions for education for veterans, uh, active military. And it, it, Tennessee just tends to be a military friendly is a state, and, and so these are not unusual for them uh, to do this type of thing. My I, oldest daughter is a senior in, in college, or in high school, and so I'm starting, just now starting to investigate this. This is not uncommon, I think, for other states to provide in-state tuition rates for out-of-state individuals that have, are serving or are veterans of the military. I, I have just found that And out. so military-affiliated individuals, does that include families then? Well, yes, it would include the like the, the, the sons and daughters of those, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Stinson, Mary McCaskey, Director of Veterans Affairs, is here. She might could help answer the question. Ms. McCaskey, if you'll come up to the microphone, because the people that are listening outside the room can't hear you. Thank you. Um, so it also will have an impact on our ROTC program uh, because what ends up happening is sometimes we have cadets that will come in and want to contract and or are planning to and they have so much commitment that they have to do first um, and they may be out of state and so therefore not eligible to receive because they aren't otherwise receiving any other type of <clears throat> military benefit. Uh, but it does also include those that are out of state who may have run out of their educational VA benefits and want to take online classes or decide they'd like to come here but they have been out for quite some time and just aren't eligible to meet under the, the current um, policy of using VA benefits. I was mostly curious about, I think, what Barry was talking about, about affiliate, what it meant to be affiliated. We, you know, one of the things that we suffer in recruiting, and this refers to what you were talking about, our, uh, what, what is our out-of-state tuition position? You know, it's easier for me to recruit a military family's trumpet player from Kentucky than it is from West Tennessee. Um, and so we're always looking at a circular route for uh, recruiting, which is actually more and people are more aware of us, so that may be something that we should all think about. Any further questions? Okay, if there's no discussion further, I get, may I get a motion to send the TTU policy 511.1 
as presented to the board for approval and to place it on the board's consent agenda. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Fred. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Seitz. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for your report, Dr. Stenson. And our next item of agenda would be performance evaluation and performance-based compensation analysis. And Mr. Kevin Vetter will present the analysis of the 2021-22 employee performance evaluation and performance-based compensation. Good morning, thank you. It's great to be here this morning. Uh, I don't have a video like enrollment management, so you're gonna be stuck with me doing uh, the presentation. I, I only know two songs, and that's the national anthem and the Army song, and you don't want me to sing either one of those, so uh, bear with me as we go through the presentation today. And as, uh, as, uh, as was said, we're going to talk about performance evaluation and then tied to that, the outcome in, in terms of compensation and rewarding and recognizing our workforce. We're going to start with uh, performance. Uh, so we're, year, we're in year seven now of our current performance evaluation process uh, tied to our merit-based pay uh, philosophy. Uh, this started back in 2015. Uh, just for clarification, uh, this is for non-faculty, and that includes our executives, such as our deans, uh, vice presidents, uh, associate vice presidents, and then administrative staff, and then our clerical and service staff. Uh, faculty are separate, and they have a, a little bit different evaluation process that they go through, and I'll be speaking to that later in my presentation. And I also think that when, when I look at a process, I also I think it's important to emphasize that this isn't just a one-time event uh, that we look at performance. It should be an ongoing conversation and discussion between the supervisor and the employee throughout the year relative to performance, tying that back to the departmental and university objectives and seeing how they're doing. Because at the end of the day, what we don't want to have happen is really a, you know, a surprise or a disconnect between what the supervisor thinks an employee is doing and how they're performing relative to what the employee and how they perceive what, what they're doing. Those should be in alignment, uh, and that's really the, the end objective that we're, we're trying to work towards. Um, the, the current evaluation tool is, is based on the uh, uh, six core values tied to Tech Tomorrow strategic plan and that uh, makes up 40% of the overall evaluation in terms of the score, and the remaining 60% is job-specific job criteria uh, that uh, is dependent upon the duties and responsibilities for a given position. And uh, uses a four-point evaluation scale going from unsatisfactory, needs improvement, meeting expectations, and exceeding expectations. So that's just kind of an overview of the, the evaluation tool itself. Uh, as I mentioned, the, you know, it's important that we tie the, the performance back to individual goals and objectives, uh, align with the department goals and objectives as well as the university, so that's what the, the, the current performance evaluation process is in, intended to do, is emphasize on those things. Uh, one of the things that we added this year is in March we did a very uh, targeted and focused outreach and engagement uh, in terms of communication about the upcoming performance evaluation process and we provided training and outreach to both supervisors and employees uh, making them aware of, of the process itself, some things to keep in mind and what to expect. And, and as I said, we did that in the month of March prior to, to going live with the evaluation, the formal evaluation process in April. This next slide shows the, the outcome of the actual evaluations. Uh, as you can see, it's a similar trend in terms of the evaluation ratings year over year with the highest percentage in meeting expectations followed by exceeding expectations. And, and that's a, been a consistent trend uh, year over year. Turning to the faculty, as I said, they have a little bit different uh, evaluation tool. Uh, six areas of emphasis as listed on the slide, 
and they use a five-point rating scale in uh, using outstanding, high, good, acceptable, and unacceptable as their evaluation criteria, rating criteria. Likewise, for the faculty, a similar trend in terms of their evaluation ratings year over year, um, as far as uh, the percentage uh, rated as, as meeting expectation, uh, outstanding, and, and high performers. As far as next steps, looking forward into the next year and how we're going to con uh, uh, continue to improve and, and move this along, uh, we want to be able to provide within our current uh, tool that uh, does the performance evaluations real-time reporting mechanism. So as a supervisor is looking at their evaluations, they're able to see the actual total score in front of them as they're working through that so they have that. Uh, incorporation of the wings up way into our evaluation uh, tool as well, and I think that's in your notes as far as exactly what, what the wings up way is. I think that will be important. Here again, emphasizing the individual contributions in relation to the goals of both the area and the university, and reinforcing the fact that this is an ongoing process throughout the year, which ties into uh, annual mandatory training for our supervisors to make sure that they understand uh, that, you know, that the performance evaluation process and the importance of that uh, as they go through and meet with their employees and work through that. Uh, any questions about the performance evaluation process before I move into compensation? I have a quick question. Um, so I'm always curious or aware of how the method of evaluation works compared to the actual employee. It's, it's great to come up with a metric and say, here's how we're going to evaluate people. But does it always actually work for each category evenly? So for instance, I know that some painters on campus um, got a 2% raise, and Jim Cobb got an 18% raise. I have a feeling this metric works better for him. And so um, that's the kind of thing that, that the campus as a whole is very aware of. Um, and we really want to be supportive of our, the people who work on campus. And it's just a hard for that person who's um, dealing with inflation, uh, like the rest of us, but already at a lower rate of income. Yes, so I, I think um, if I understand the, the question correctly as far as how the different staff categories are looked at in terms of their performance and then uh, rewarded, um, obviously it's, it's going to depend upon, too, the, the salary range uh, as you get into some of the uh, higher level administrative, you know, staff, um, you know, a 4% on their salary versus, uh, you know, a clerical and service staff is going to be different because of the salary differential. Uh, but I, in, in total, what does happen is all of those staff categories are, are looked at and, and the raise allocation is afforded to them uh, in the same manner. So for your cler clerical and service staff, they're getting a 4% allocation. And within that, supervisors and areas have the latitude to reward and recognize their highest performers by being able to give somebody a little bit more. Now, what that does mean, though, is obviously you're going to have to give someone else a little bit less if you really want to reward the top performers. But within each category, we have the latitude to be able to do that. I guess my concern directly is that to make sure that we're, that the uh, evaluation is of the work that they're supposed to be doing, not, uh, and we have this problem when we're going through tenure and um, promotion processes, the process that's in the, um, the uh, policy sometimes doesn't easily fit all the different categories of, of work. So for instance, what I term as research, somebody else on campus might think is not research. So now when you get down to a staff level and we're giving them below a um, um, cost of living increase in their, uh, in their wage and the market is um, pretty competitive for labor, that's what I'm talking about. I'm saying, are they being evaluated um, accurately for their work, or is, is there too much leeway in this way? It's like, well, look at, look at all these things. Are they, are they painting the wings up way? Um, is that a reason I can give them 2% rather than cost of living? I, I can't say that that is or is not happening. What I can say is the way the tool is currently constructed is, as I said, 40% is tied to the uh, 
uh, Tech Tomorrow strategic plan. One of the things that we want to build into that, though, is the uh, Wings Up Way, because I think there's aspects of the Wings Up Way that ties more directly to some of our clerical and service staff because they can see themselves doing those things as far as how they're helping out students, how they're enabling uh, through the processes that they control and perform to be able to help others be able to, to do their job to support our faculty and staff. So I think in that regard, that's a refinement that if we make, I think they can uh, more uh, carefully or, or better see how they align to the to the the wings up way and supporting that and I think that will also help the supervisor but 60% of their overall work performance is tied to you know job related duties so how well are they performing such as if we're talking about you know someone that's going out and uh, doing uh, grounds maintenance how well are they doing that grounds maintenance relative uh, to their uh, you know colleagues that are also doing that work and within that area so I, I do think that that's something that is happening now could it be improved upon and, and uh, you know done better I think that's always something that we're striving to do and that's why we're continuing to focus on training uh, with our supervisors and in our and our employees around that okay I don't mean to be obtuse I'm saying if somebody paints well and there's no application of the wings up way in their job but they're getting their work done is that a detriment to their potential for a raise well, I would say that if somebody paints well, that that does tie back to the Wings Up way uh, and our, because it's, it's, it's helping to beautify the campus, making a positive image of what the university looks like. And when somebody comes and sees here, I think that they, you know, that, that is an outward facing thing because of that, what that person did to help that. I, I think that that can be recognized for that. So if a supervisor of that person gives them a 2% raise, um, in a year where that's not nearly enough for the cost of living. And that person has the leeway to say, well, that wasn't the wings up way. Or maybe the point is the supervisor is not advocating or the supervisor needs training to figure out that painting a room on time and well and with the standard that we would expect is the wings up way. Because 2% of a very low wage already is not enough in a competitive job market, especially. Yeah, and I understand that within you know within an environment and a market right now that has high inflation, certainly that further amplifies that problem. And I would say that you know we do try to have checks and balances within that. So a given supervisor you know puts their recommendations forward that's then reviewed by the next level supervisor. So there is at least some evaluation going on as far as the ratings, and you know. Do these ratings make sense? Do they seem appropriate or not? And that's something that you know gets uh, consolidated all the way up uh, and, and presented to the, you know the, the division uh, elements to be able to see those things and look at them and, and, and see what we have. I guess my concern again would be that there's so many levels to go up to to the point where you would maybe know that a supervisor at that level had recommended them as a two percent raise that it's not really that noticeable. There's so many layers, whereas an upper administration person, there aren't that many levels. So if they get an 18% raise, one person may look at that and say, okay. So do you think, it, let me ask this as a hypothetical question. Say somebody is a good painter, did a good job on our campus. Would you know that they only got a 2% raise or would you have the capacity to say, why are these people at the lowest salary level in our university getting this incredibly low raise in a year where the job market is competitive and the cost of living has gone up. I mean, we, we do have those metrics that we can look at that to see, you know, what the distribution is across various staff groups. I know that that exists, but what I'm saying is, does it happen? Because in this case, I know that those people got a 2% raise because I'm a representative that people send information to. But that's not my job to look at that on a yearly basis. And, and what I would say is, what we do is we put out salary guidelines that says a 4% merit allocation. And then it's up to the supervisors throughout this process to allocate that as they deem appropriate based on how that a given person performed. So could a population or a particular person get a 2%? Yes, it's, it's, it's very possible. Now that should tie to you know, their, their performance and how they, how they did. So if someone is exceeding expectation, you would expect that they would get a higher 
uh, percentage as far as merit versus someone that's maybe meeting expectations or uh, if they're not meeting, they're not going to get anything. So I'm asking you as a trustee, I would like to know that you are concerned, as I am, about the people in this campus who get paid the least not getting a cost of living wage raise and that that should be looked at that those people needed to be looked after as much as anybody because they're less protected. They have less advocates. Um, it's just by, and I'm, I'm not talking about one person with a 2% raise, by the way. This is a we situation when they came to me um, through other people. So um, I need to know that as part of human resources, that that is carefully being looked at, that that should be a red flag, actually, when the people on the lowest uh, employment level of our university are getting um, raises that are not um, equitable. It was not even 4%, and they're already at a low wage, and the market is hot. We either need to get, you know, if I were you, I'd be saying, man, we need to find better painters, or we need to pay these painters better because that is a red flag to me. 2%, that is a red flag. Professor Alcott, if I could, I, I'd like to suggest that it, while it is certainly Mr. Vetter's responsibility to be sure that we are paying fairly across the board. I would hope that you would understand and agree, and I don't have any idea whether our painters and our landscape people and our, and the, and the I, I know about the president, I don't know about the deans, I don't know about everybody, but I have to trust that the supervisors are responsible for those people, they know those people the best, and and to Mr. Vetter's point, and I think it's my most important concern, is that our supervisors are adequately trained. And as much as we want to be sure people are being paid what they're worth, their relative value to each other is up to the supervisor. And so I think we have to leave that in the hands of the supervisors. And while Mr. Vetter may have some concerns, he can, he can investigate that, but I don't think we need to be talking about individual positions at the board meeting, if that's okay. Yes, I'm just making that, using this as a hypothetical because the board is the president's supervisor. The president is uh, Dr. Stinson's supervisor. Dr. Stinson is your supervisor. He's the supervisor of those people. It's so far down. I'm I, saying there are red flags that it, should it, come up. It happens in every industry, and this is a fairly large enterprise, but there are people around this table and on the phone that are parts of enormous enterprises, and this happens every day where people are having to be, re be reviewed, and I'll just point out that that is the responsibility of their supervisor. There have been comments around this table that people were given too high an increase from time to time. We, we want to be sure that people are getting the right message, and I know Mr. Vetter is intent on doing that, and I think that we should give him the opportunity to do that, and I don't think we as a board can take on an individual salary uh, expectation for any any set of employees, including the deans or the vice presidents or the uh, people who paint or do all the other important jobs here at the university. Thank you. No further comment. Thank you. Are there are any further questions? Just a, a comment. comment. Perspective. I, I completely the question. I have a comment. Okay. So, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you. My comment is, is, is uh, I think there is a point that Dr. Alcott's made that's important, given the extraordinary inflationary environment that we're in, uh, maybe it's something the board might consider at some point to put a floor on, on what, what an increase might uh, need to be during a cycle. So, meaning you could say hey, there's still differentiation, from, from a performance standpoint, but no one will get less than X. And, and Mr. Lowry, just to remind you, we have, we have such a floor, and it's, it was 1% this year. We could have made it two, and that would have been just as fine, but we did have a floor. Yeah, for for so, people who were competent, I guess I should say. There was, absolutely. Right. Yeah, so I, it's a future, future comment around what that floor needs to be. I think that's an excellent comment. Just my comment was in the, I agree with Trudy, and uh, 
in an economy where the inflation is going really high, it is not feasible or possible for all organizations to keep up with a cost of living increase. It simply means that we are having a decline in standard of living for all of us. And unfortunately, that does tend to impact the lo those at the, the sort of the bottom the most. And I certainly agree that you need to be aware of that and uh, you need to be competitive. But um, I, I think you have to leave that up to the system and the supervisors. I do agree that it's very, very important to train all the supervisors as best you can, knowing that in reality, uh, supervisors will vary. They're not all robots. There will be some, some choices, some leadership decisions that some make and others don't. And you have to, you have to accept that as part of the system if you're gonna do merit-based pay. And I think that's the decision that we've already made. So thank you. And, and I would just add in, in that regard, uh, I serve as a board member to the College University Personnel Association for the state of Tennessee. And uh, it's something that's indicative of all of my colleagues across the state right now that we're faced with, with these challenges with high inflation, uh, inflation a highly competitive, talent-driven uh, market. So it, it does challenge us to be competitive. Uh, and all of those things really fit into what we're trying to do strategically from an HR standpoint around total rewards and looking at what we're, how we're rewarding and how we're compensating our employees, both external candidates and then considering our current workforce and how we manage that. Uh, training and development, I think, is, is critically important for an engaged and satisfied workforce. For all, so all of those things tie together. And then looking at just how are we doing in terms of a workforce as far as do we have the right people in the right positions with the right skills and talent to be successful for both today and the challenges of the future. So all four of those things taken in, in total, I think are gonna position us up for success, but it is gonna be challenging. And we do have to think very intentionally and strategically about how we go about doing those things. But I'm, I'm concerned about certainly how we're rewarding and recognizing our staff and making sure that we're as competitive as possible, knowing that we don't have an endless amount of resources and we have to be very targeted in how we choose to, to, to handle and address some of those issues. And there's some things that we've got in the works to help us do that that I think are going to really give us some good information and some good resources. Because I see this every day in, in my role as far as, uh, you know, trying to be competitive with our offers to external uh, candidates while also being sensitive to the fact of what does that do to our internal employees that are already here and being similarly situated, how do we balance that out? So all of those are things that we have to work together as a university uh, to work through. Anybody else have any other questions, comments? In, in your book, on page 33 and 34, it shows a distribution of the base salary by categories to the staff. And it says that 291 were high performers and 383 were middle performers, and only 0.04% were low performers. That is for staff. If you go over to the and, uh, faculty, the faculty had 328 high performers and 34 low performers, and only 1.8 percent uh, poor low performers. 34 middle performers, only 1.8 percent low performers. It would seem that either the supervisors are not grading the same across the staff and the faculty, or we've got a faculty that's far and away better than the staff we've got. Well, you know, I, I definitely think that there is obviously some variation um, from supervisor to supervisor. Uh, so you're, so you're gonna have some of that. But I think here again, it's, it's incumbent upon the way we've got this built that it's kind of like within the supervisory chain and, and, and that, that you know, we're reviewing within the division and, and as we go up higher in the organization to see do we, do we think that we have a, a level of consistency that we can accept or is there other areas or concerns that we may need to go back and see this, this doesn't appear to be uh, heading in the right direction, but that's what we're trying to move towards is, is have a degree of consistency as far as how we're evaluating our staff, knowing that there's always going to be some variation. 
So when you look at this and you see that the faculty has 89% high performers as judged by their supervisors and the staff has 41% high performers as judged by their supervisors, that doesn't give you any cause for concern that the supervisors might not be grading them the same? Well, I, I, I definitely think that, you know, there, there's a difference there. Now, it's also a, a factor of um, who's, you know, who, who the supervisors are for our staff relative to, you know, the faculty and, and how they're, about, you know, how that supervision is a little bit different. I mean, we do have obviously uh, supervisors that are, super, uh, that are evaluating both faculty and staff, uh, but there are some differences there too where uh, we may just have an academic area that's evaluating the faculty and, and, and the staff is not, as far as the proportion of the staff, they're not evaluating as many of those individuals. But, but just a point of clarification, just because the uh, faculty may tend to score much higher than the staff, it doesn't necessarily mean that the faculty are ta is taking money away from the staff. It's still a, you, you know, it's, a, it's the 4% average. It, so, it's a separate pool of money. The, the yeah. faculty have their 4%, the staff have 4%, and the, uh, so it, it's broken out into, into, so into those buckets. So Johnny, my point is it, does, it doesn't bother me that 89% uh, are considered, I guess, high performers. They still have to figure out how to distribute that amount, same amount of money. You know. uh, just so you understand, I did not say what you just said. All I said was, is it give him concern that the performance evaluations are not consistent across the board? Somebody in the faculty is grading far higher than the people in the staff are grading, which I think is what uh, Dr. Alcott's. Um, we know how to work toward metrics. This is what we do for a living. Yeah. So when there's a metric that is tied to our um, performance evaluation, that's more, that's something we are good at, frankly. Um, and so I think m my biggest point might be that, you know, there might be a level of employment entry into this university that doesn't quite fit our metric on, um, or maybe we need to consider a different metric or a higher minimum at that level. Um, it's hard to get people to, to work. We all know that the labor market is, you know, is tight and but the, the times are challenging for those people. So I think that's between these things that might be the um, the thought that we can have about that because I'm very concerned. And when when faculty talk about salaries, you, you all know on the board of trustees when we talk about salaries, we're not, I'm not talking about my salary. We rarely talk about our own. Nobody that I know talks about their own salary. We're just talking about making sure taking care of the greater campus and the people that work here. So it would seem to me, Madam Chairman, that this is an area we ought to continue to work on to be certain that our supervisors are all trained the same so that the people who are raking the yard out there have the same kind of supervisory evaluation as the people who are PhDs standing in the classroom get. And whatever that is, it should be the same. You're not grading them on the same, but you have the same definition of what a high performer is. I thought it was outstanding, high, and there was five categories, but this only talks about three. Well, I, I believe Mr. Vetter explained earlier that the staff has a separate, I think you said a four-point rating, and the faculty has a five-point rating. And, and I completely agree with you that we need to have consistent training and that there are things that are 100% consistent from no matter whether you're managing teachers or engineers or professional football players or whatever you're managing, there, there are certain things that are consistent. Yes. And then I would also suggest that there are some things that are different when you're managing people who have different roles. I know in my own business, I had salespeople who needed to be managed differently than accountants. Didn't mean they, I, I, I didn't use the exact same scale, I guess, in my own mind. Just from my own experience, I'm just giving you my experience. I know you've managed a lot of different kinds of people. 
And sometimes you have to make some judgments about what's appropriate and how you reward or, or, or disincentivize someone from, for their performance, depending on kind of what works for that kind of person or that kind of role. So while I'm, I'm a huge believer that we need more training, I don't think we can have too much training. And I think Mr. Vetter knows that. We've, I've talked to him about that. I've talked to the president about that. We need mandatory training. It can't just be show up if you feel like it, show up if you're interested. You have to be trained. The, the supervisors, to, to Mr. Alcott's point, the supervisors, each one needs to be looking at the levels below them to the extent that they can and be ensure that they're being consistent. But then at the end of the day, we're paying people to supervise and they have to be allowed to supervise and make their own judgments, I believe, about individual compensation. So I agree with that. But within, I within our constraints, of course. They ought to have to go to the training if we're going to train them. And that's not our job to make sure that's done. That's Phil's job. That's right. Well, it's actually, it'll be Kevin's job. But, but, he, he's but, the guy but we, we, can tell, we can tell Phil who can tell Kevin, yeah. right? OK. I think uh, that's all I have to say. Do you have anything further to say, Mr. Vetter? If you'd like, I can proceed through the, 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 the merit allocation, or do you just want me to, I, I think you've already kind of covered some of the information, but I just want to make sure that if we're good with that, I'll, uh, if there's any other questions, I can talk about next steps, if that's agreeable with everyone. That would be my preference. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I said, we really want to, uh, you know, as far as the next steps, focus on the value of the individual contributions relative to the department and university goals. Uh, help supervisors here again with providing them with some merit allocation approaches that they can use on a consistent basis for the employees that they're evaluating and, and allocating those, those merit distributions. So that's something that we're going to be looking at doing. Uh, a real-time graphic representation of those merit allocations made by the supervisors so they can see that in real time as they're, they're being done. And also then using that as a tool to share that actually with their employees as they're talking through this so they can actually visually see where they are at relative to their peers and then what does it going to take for that individual person to be able to get up to that next level or a, a higher level. Uh, so I think those are all going to be important things going forward that will here again help us uh, you know, continue to improve this process and, and really reward and recognize uh, our workforce. Subject to any other questions, that's, that's everything that I have for today. Kevin, if you don't mind, let me, let me amplify this just a little bit because I think what we've learned here um, is that, uh, one thing at least, is that the, the evaluation process uh, and the subsequent uh, uh, merit raise distribution are, are, are two interrelated events, but they're independent in time and space, okay, if that makes any sense to you. So, so the supervisors doing the evaluations in spring, April time frame, uh, and uh, the, the way the current instrument works and what, what Kevin has gotten to here is that it's very difficult to determine, I mean, you, they're doing it in good faith, they're, they're working through the, uh, the form, doing the evaluation, they're meeting with the employee, and they're evaluating each of those elements, but they, there's not a good way for the supervisor at that point in time to see exactly what that employee is being rated overall relative to everybody else that they're supervising. And so the only time they see that is, is a couple months later when they're looking at salary distributions and, and then they see the relative uh, ranking within their units of how they've evaluated their, uh, their reports and, uh, and then trying to make critical decisions about relative raises based on that. And so since it's separated in time and space, it's a little difficult for the supervisor, we believe, to, to adequately understand. Because it's, you know, it's been a couple of months. They've slept several times since then, and, and they may not remember exactly what that conversation was like. And so what we're trying to do here is, is develop better tools for the supervisor so that they can kind of track that in real time and, and hopefully uh, eliminate some of that. Uh, you know, as the process goes on. Is that, did I summarize that okay, Kevin? Yes, that's correct, Dr. Oldham. 
Is there anything else to bring up about the uh, this particular item? If not, item 10 is tenure upon appointment, recommendation, and there is no action on that last item. So Dr. Bruce will present the tenure recommendation. Dr. Bruce. Thank you. Um, I bring to you an agenda item today on behalf of the president. This is a request or recommendation to award tenure upon promotion of a new hire, uh, Dr. Joey Shaw, who has been hired uh, to come in as the director of our School of Agriculture. His hire was made after the June board meeting, which was when the rest of the tenure recommendations came forward, and that's why this is kind of coming out of cycle uh, with the rest of the tenure recommendations. I do sometimes get questions about these tenure upon appointment. I just want to clarify that the faculty have voted unanimously to award tenure. They review the person's qualifications to ensure that they exceed the requirements for awarding of tenure uh, as if they had come up through the faculty ranks at Tennessee Tech. So this is an individual who has uh, uh, come up through the faculty ranks and spent 24 years as a, as a tenured faculty member at Auburn in their School of Agriculture. And so we're very fortunate to be able to hire him to come in as our director for our School of Agriculture. Anyone have any questions? Did you give him a copy of our tenure policy for him to read? I'm sorry, what? Did you give him a copy of our tenure policy for him to read? Yeah. I would assume that he, he has looked at it very closely if he's uh, giving up tenure at another university after many years to come to a new university. I would assume that you do that with all tenure applicants. Is that correct? Do what? They, all the people who are recommended for tenure are given a copy of our tenure policy so they understand it? Yes. I, I would assume he, was, he has seen that policy. I do not recall individually that individual if I gave them a copy of the tenure policy. But they are pointed to all of our policies to review them all before they accept an appointment of faculty. Thank you. If there are no other questions then, um, can I get a motion to send the tenure recommendation to the board for approval and place it on the board's consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Fred. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Thomas. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Lowry. 